Business for us commissioners is item B, the adoption of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? And okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Um, the next item is item number C, which is the approval of the May 11th, 2023 minutes. Do I have a motion to approve? Okay, motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay, motion carries. Um, item D is recognition of council members. And I think we have three. Um, council Lady Hauser, I saw you walking in. Oh, Council Lady Hauser, do you want to speak now or would you like to speak with your item? Okay. Um, Councilman Rosenberg. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you. It's good to see y'all. I'm here to speak briefly on two items. One of them is number 16. It's the 8033 Highway 100 SP amendment. It's the Wawa. Um, this um, allows this use and makes a slight adjustment, uh, adjustment to the River Trace UDO. I didn't know how this was going to go when I put it out as an option to the community. And it turns out that Wawa fans are wild. Um, it's been an incredibly actually overwhelming, not unanimous by any stretch of the imagination. I think that we've got some work to do before council to tighten it up, but it's been probably 80, 20 in support. And um, I'd be grateful for your support on it so we can continue working on it. The other item is uh, Bellevue Bend. I don't know what number it is, but I'm sure you'll have that. Um, Bellevue Ben, since the last meeting, and there were a lot more, um, I think, questions that have been answered on this that the Planning Commission had last time around, some additional conditions. There are a lot of conditions on the developer, and if any one of them can't get met, then this project won't move forward. In the meantime, I think it's important to let facts rule the day over conjecture. This is, and, and to keep in mind that this is way outside of any floodplains that's not even part of the conversation. There's $12 million in public improvements that are going to be privately funded to a huge benefit of the community. It's going to bring housing right off the interstate. It's not going to cause any uh, transportation, traffic issues, anything along those lines. And I'd be grateful uh, for your support on that as well so that we can move that on to the next step in the process. That was right. item Thank 12A you. and 12B. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, next council person, Councilman Parker. Hey, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, thanks as always for being here. We've got one district five item on the agenda. It's item 20. This is, um, I think it's the Douglas Ave multifamily is the name of the thing it's at 1003 Douglas this is right at the corner of Douglas and Gallatin um, if you know that area you um, if you drive bike or walk through that area you know that there's kind of a serious congestion and traffic light queue issue um, and one thing that I'm excited for about this proposal is that it will go a long way toward alleviating that issue um, some of the improvements they're going to make to that intersection as well as um, uh, improving the timing for pedestrians at um, Douglas and Gallatin there. Um, this is adjacent to the large Lincoln Tech redevelopment project that um, y'all approved unanimously fairly recently. Uh, this has a different owner, so it was not included with that initial SP, but it's, I think, comparable. I think that the community kind of used them as, as similar. Um, that neighborhood group is not meeting regularly right now, so we did ask the folks with this project to have a special meeting. They had that. It was not well attended. Um, which I took as a sign that we kind of, as a community, had the conversation about the direction that the neighborhood was headed with the Lincoln Tech, um, which was the real big change and, and um, uh, 
So I took that as a sign that, that folks are generally fairly okay with this, although there might be some folks here this evening. Um, but I, I'm in support of the project and I would ask for y'all's support as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council members? Okay. Okay. Um, so with that, we will move on to the next agenda item, which is the um, items for deferral or withdrawal. Okay, sorry. Items for deferral or withdrawal. And welcome back. Sounds great. Okay, items for deferral and withdrawal. Um, starting on page three of your agenda, item number one, 2015 SP 069003. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th Planning Commission meeting. Item 2A, 2017 SP 087004 Hill Property SP Amendment in the associated case on page four of your agenda, item number 2B, 2023 SP 016001, The Village at Autumn View. The recommendation on those two items is to defer to the June 8th Planning Commission meeting. Continuing on page four of the agenda, item number three, 2019 SP 053001, Ackland Park Residential SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th Planning Commission meeting. Item number four, 2023 SP 040001, 4057 Maxwell Road Residential SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th meeting. Item number five, 2023 SP 043001, Nolansville Pike SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th meeting. Item number six, 2023Z037PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th meeting. And on page five of your agenda, item number seven, 2018S059003, Orchards Phase 3. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th meeting. Item number eight, 2018S059004, Orchards Phase 2. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th meeting. Item number nine, 2019S039002, Payne Road Subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th meeting. Item number 10, 2023S042001, St. Luke Presbyterian Church. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th meeting. Item number 11, 2023S063001, Thornton Grove. PUD page four, PUD phase 4A. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th meeting. <coughs> On page six of your agenda, item number 13A, 2023 CP000003, staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th Planning Commission meeting. In the associated case, item number 13B, 2022 SP021001, Burke Hampstead, staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. On page seven of your agenda, item number 14, nope. So sorry, item number 14 is not on the items for deferral. Um, on page seven, item number 17, 2022 SP 0661, 114-118-JC Napier. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th Planning Commission meeting. Continuing on page eight of the agenda, item number 18, staff recommendation or 18, 2023 SP 030001, 1806 and 1808 Division Street. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th meeting. Item number 22, 2023 SP 042001, 5043 Mount View Preliminary SP. Staff recommendation is deferred to the June 8th meeting. Continuing on page nine of your agenda, item number 23, 2023. SP 047001, McAlpine SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th Planning Commission meeting. Continuing on page 10 of your agenda, item number 28, 2023 Z054PR001, 
Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th Planning Commission meeting. On page 11 of your agenda, item number 37, 2023 S2530001, first revision, lot one, resub um, of Madison Heights. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 8th meeting. Item number 38, 2023 S026001, Martin Reserve Subdivision. Staff recommendation is defer to the June 8th meeting. And that concludes our items for deferral. Okay, I'm gonna read these back. I feel like I made, I missed one, um, but I'm okay to start. So items on the uh, deferral withdrawal list, item one, items 2A and 2B, item three, item four, item five, item six, item seven, item eight, eight item nine, item 10, 11, 13A, 13B, 17, 18, 22, 23, I thought 28, but I wasn't positive you called 28. Yes, item 28. Item 28. Okay, 28, 37, and 38. That's correct. Okay. Okay, commissioners, that is the items that we have for deferral or withdrawal. I have a motion to approve. Okay, any other discussion? All in favor? Okay, motion carries. Um, and now we are on to the consent agenda. Okay. Um, so I will read through the items on the consent agenda um, or the tentative consent agenda and ask if anyone is here in opposition to these items. If so, please raise your hand um, and these items will be presented tonight. If no one is in opposition to the item, it will remain on the consent agenda. As noticed to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. The first item on our tentative consent agenda is item is page on page seven of your agenda, item number 16. 2022 SP0410028033 Highway 100 SP amendment. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? Seeing no one, that item will be on the consent agenda. On page eight of your agenda, item number 20. 2023 SP 033001, 1003 Douglas Avenue multifamily. Is anyone here in opposition to that item? Seeing no one, that item will be on the consent agenda. On page nine of your agenda, item number 24. 2022 Z 118 PR 001, a request to rezone at 189 Little Green Street. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be on the consent agenda. Item number 25, 2023 Z 035 PR 001, a request to rezone along Whites Creek Pike. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be on the consent agenda. Item number 26, 2023 Z050 PR 001, a request to rezone along Couchville Pike. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be on the consent agenda. On page 10 of your agenda, item number 29, 2023 Z055 PR 001, a request to rezone along Clifton Avenue. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be on the consent agenda. Item number 30, 2023Z056PR001, a request to rezone along 4th Avenue South. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be on the consent agenda. Item number 31, 2023Z057PR001, a request to rezone along Manchester Avenue. Is anyone in opposition to this item? This item will be on the consent agenda. Item number 32, 2023Z058PR001, a request to rezone along Mainstream Drive. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? 
This item will be on the consent agenda. Item number 33, 2023-Z059-PR-001, a request to rezone along Athens Way. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be on the consent agenda. On page 11 of your agenda, item number 34, 2023-Z060-PR-001, a request to rezone along Mainstream, Mainstream Drive. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be on the consent agenda. Item number 35, 2001 UD 002014, Music Row UDO cancellation. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be on the consent agenda. Item number 36, 2020 S 207003, Chandler Reserve. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be on the agenda to be heard. And moving on to page 12 of your agenda, item number 39, 2023-S045-001, um, Temple Heights subdivision. Um, is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the agenda to be heard. Okay, and I am gonna go ahead and run through those with the full caption now. Um, as information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. So our consent agenda tonight starts on page seven with item 16, 2022 SP041-002-8033 Highway 100 SP amendment, which is a request to amend the SP um, along at 8033 Highway 100. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions, including a modification to the River Trace UDO related to the location of the gas canopy. Moving on to page eight of your agenda. Item number 20, 2023 SP033001-1000 Douglas Avenue, multifamily, a request to rezone from RS5 to SP at 1003 Douglas Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 24 on page nine of your agenda. Item 24-2022-Z118-PR-001, a request to rezone from IWD to MUNA for property at 189 Little Green Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 25-2023-Z035-PR-001, a request to rezone from RS 7.5 to ARM 20NS for property at 2505 Whites Creek Pike. Staff recommendation is to disapprove RM 20 NS and approve RM 15 A at RM 15 A NS. Item number 26, 2023 Z 050 PR 001, a request to rezone from R20 to IWD for properties at 2537 and 2541 Couchville Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. Moving on to page 10 of the agenda. Item number 29, 2023Z055PR001, a request to rezone from IR to OR20A for properties along Clifton Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 30, 2023Z056PR001, a request to rezone from SP to MULA NS for properties along 4th Avenue South. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 31, 2023Z057PR001, a request to rezone from RS10 to R10 for properties along Manchester Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 32, 2023Z058PR001, a request to rezone from IWD to MUGNS for property at 501 Mainstream. Staff recommendation is to approve. 
Item number 33-2023-Z059-PR-001, a request to rezone from IWD to MUGNS for property at 210 Athens Way. Staff recommendation is to approve. On to page 11 of your agenda, item number 34-2023-Z060-PR-001, a request to rezone from IWD to MUGNS for property at 540 Main Street Drive. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 35, 2001 UD 002014, Music Row Cancellation, a request to cancel a UDO for properties along McGavick Street. McGavick Street. Um, staff recommendation is to approve. And on page 12 of your agenda, item H, um, numbers 41, employment contract amendment for Abby Rickoff and Katie Kamizas, and item 45, accept the director's report. Okay, a lengthy list. Okay, um, so going back through the numbers, let's do it very carefully. So on the consent agenda, we have item 16, item 20, Item 24, item 25, item 26, item 29, item 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 41, and 45. That's correct. Okay. Commissioners, that is our uh, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay, motion carries. With your permission, I just wanted to note um, that you've approved a contract for Abby Rickoff, who's been with the department since 2016, and she's been promoted to a planning manager one, given all of her hard work and uh, dedication and technical expertise. It's been a pleasure working with her, and I'm proud of her promotion, working with Lisa. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now we've embarrassed her. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> okay, so now we need to go back over the list of items that we're going to hear today. So on the list of items that we will be hearing, item 12A and 12B, item 14, item 15, item 18, Item 19, item 21, 27, 36, 39, and item 40. Item number 18 was deferred to June oh. 8th. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, sorry. And then 40, yes, we will conclude with uh, the election of officers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Do you want to run through those again? Okay, yes. Item 12A, 12B, items 14, 15, 19, 21, 27, 36, 39, and item 40, which is the election of the officers. Yep. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so with that, we will get started with item 12A. Oh, yeah. Um, so for the commission, we, we did hear this one um, several meetings ago, and at that time we um, chose to um, close the public hearing. Um, and generally our policy is that unless there's been a, a change to the plan, we do not reopen the public hearing because we have not re-noticed the meeting. So um, obviously that's up to the commission, and if there is a difference of opinion, um, you know, we can, we can rediscuss. Um, but for now, I guess we will go ahead with at least the staff update. Yes, we do have a presentation for you. We, the commissioners had a number of technical questions, so we've got information um, to present uh, with our responses to that information. So we have Mr. Elliott here. I just wanted to go on record. I did watch it too on YouTube. All right, thank you.
Thank you, Chair, and good evening, Commissioners. My name is Logan Elliott with the Planning Department, and I'll be presenting staff's recommendation and the update on item 12B, the specific plan, uh, Arisa Bend at Bellevue. The request is to rezone property to SP to permit a multifamily development. And there's an associated community plan amendment with the application that is proposing suburban neighborhood evolving policy to the portion of the site that's outside of the floodplain. SAS recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions if the associated plan amendment is approved and to disapprove the SP if the associated plan amendment is not approved. Um, so as a reminder, this item was heard at the March 9th, 2023 planning commission and the planning commission deferred the item to allow staff to have additional time to compile uh, technical information related to the specific plan uh, and staff responded to these requests in the staff report and we'll go through each one now. Uh, the first one was to have representatives of Stormwater and NDOT attend the meeting and they're both here in attendance tonight and available to answer any questions that you may have. The second was to provide a traffic control plan for the proposed improvements to Coley Davis Road to demonstrate uh, how traffic flow would be maintained during the construction process. And the applicant uh, did provide a draft temporary uh, traffic control plan that demonstrates the ability to maintain two-way traffic on Coley Davis Road during the construction. The plan phases the improvement so that the uh, first Coley Davis would be widened and then one side of the road would be raised at a time, allowing two-way traffic to be maintained. And NDOT has reviewed this uh, draft temporary traffic control plan and finds it to be feasible, feasible, but ultimately it would need to be provided and approved uh, later in the development process by NDOT. The third item was uh, a request for the applicant to provide an emergency vehicle access plan uh, for the site that would demonstrate how emergency vehicles would um, access and how the access would be controlled uh, from Morton Mill Road. And the ability for emergency vehicles to navigate the site will need to be reviewed with the final site plan application once the engineered site plans have been prepared, consistent with the standard process for SP de uh, developments. Without the fully engineered uh, civil site plans, the standard turning details and the ability to make all necessary emergency vehicle movements on the site cannot be reviewed. Uh, therefore, the fire marshal's office uh, has confirmed that they cannot confirm this at this time. Uh, also, they confirmed that Coley Davis Road would be the primary route utilized for emergency access and that the gated access and Morton Mill would uh, utilize the standard locking system that the fire marshal's office would review at the final site plan and that they would only utilize Coley Davis Road in the uh, they would only utilize Morton Mill Road in the instance that Coley Davis was unaccessible. The fourth was providing more information from CSX that verified their position on the proposed greenway crossing. And CSX has reviewed the SP development plan and they did raise some concerns uh, and were not supportive at this time of the proposed tunnel crossing that was uh, that is an option provided in the SP. Um, and that this information that staff received was contrary to information that we had received prior to the March 9th planning commission hearing where they had indicated that both, uh, both greenway crossing options were potentially viable. Um, as an alternative, CSX confirmed that they're willing to review a proposal that includes a greenway crossing under the existing railroad bridge and that there are some conditions uh, related to their review of that, essentially that they would uh, prioritize their own interests and ability to use their rail line above the Greenway crossing. Um, but staff recommends leaving both the tunnel and the bridge underpass option in the SP as Metro Parks supports both of these options and CSX could change their position on the tunnel versus underpass in the future and leaving both of these options in the SP plan uh, is the recommendation of staff. The fifth item was a condition related to the uh, proposed bridge from Coley Davis to this subject site and who would be responsible for this for the maintenance of this bridge and NDOT has revised their conditions of approval to specify that NDOT is generally in support of the proposed public bridge from Coley Davis Road to this bend in the Harpeth River 
and that uh, additional information will need to be provided with the final site plan application before NDOT can make any final determinations on acceptance of the bridge. Um, and therefore, it, it is possible that NDOT does not accept maintenance of the bridge pending review of the final design of the bridge. The sixth item uh, were, was related to the comments from NDOT concerning the review of the bridge and the improvements to Coley Davis Road and NDOT's revised their conditions to specify the, the desired conditions for Coley Davis Road. And NDOT is conditioning that the final cross section for Coley Davis Road consists of a 10 foot wide two way multi use path along the southern side of Coley Davis Road with a two foot wide vertical protection buffer between the travel lanes and the multi use path. And that the boundaries of the multi use path would need to be determined with the final site plan. And that at a minimum, the development shall make meaningful connections to existing pedestrian infrastructure on Coley Davis Road while also creating a functional network. And that at a minimum, the applicant shall extend the multi use path to the west and connect to the existing sidewalk on Coley Davis Road along the front edge of the Harpeth Springs Village. Um, additionally, while the TIS determined that a westbound left turn lane on Coley Davis Road onto the subject bridge, was not technically warranted, that NDOT is willing to consider the applicant providing this left turn lane if the engineered plans that are prepared with the final site plan application demonstrate that the cross section can accommodate this given the dimensional constraints in the area. Um, and that if there are issues with the, the left turn lane onto the bridge that um, the ability to provide this would need to be reevaluated. Uh, the seventh, item was a response to the question of what will happen downstream of the Harpeth River, considering the proposed project includes a new bridge and floodplain modifications. And the applicant provided a draft hydraulic analysis of the proposed development to, to demonstrate the potential impacts to the effective flood uh, mapping of the Harpeth River in this location. And following the standard process, this hydraulic analysis would need to be reviewed and approved by FEMA and then provided to Metro Stormwater for review and approval with the final site plan. And the hydraulic analysis is just a draft document at this point. Um, and in review of the draft document, uh, the, the document demonstrates that there'll be no downstream or in upstream impacts to the regulatory 100 year floodplain uh, associated with the construction of this development and that includes the construction of the bridge, the raising of Coley Davis Road uh, and the potential underpass of the Greenway uh, on, along the Harpeth River. Um, additionally, the analysis modeled the impacts to the 500 year floodplain, which is not jurisdictional. Um, and they again found that there would be no downstream impacts to the 500 year floodplain. Upstream of the development, uh, the draft hydraulic analysis did find that um, a potential difference of about 0.23 to 0.25 feet or about three inches uh, could be realized uh, um, north of the CSX bridge that the Greenway is proposed to cross um, and that south of that CSX bridge, there would be no impact to the 500 year floodplain associated with this development. The eighth item is a response to the title question surrounding the Greenway easement and the access easement. Uh, the Greenway easement is in the Harpeth Crest subdivision open space parcel and the access easement is also within a Harpeth Crest subdivision open space parcel. Uh, and Metro Legal has assessed that the courts would likely find that the existing Greenway easement as platted on the Harpeth Crest subdivision open space parcel does permit the proposed greenway connection from the existing terminus uh, in the subdivision and also Metro Legal has assessed that the courts would likely find that the applicant has the right to reasonable use of the existing access easement that is platted at the end of Morton Mill Road in the Harvest Crest subdivision access easement and that would likely permit them to utilize that easement for construction emergency access purposes. Um, additionally, the applicant provided massing models to demonstrate the visual impacts uh, of the development to the surrounding area. Um, so there's three different models that were provided. Um, we'll go through these one at a time. The first is from Coley Davis Road, looking over the bridge, the proposed bridge onto the site, 
showing the um, approximate perspective. The second is internal to the site, looking west towards the uh, Morton Mill Road or the railroad. And this is that perspective. And then the third is looking east from the end of Morton Mill Road onto the site. Showing here. So in conclusion, uh, staff finds the proposed SP to be consistent with the suburban neighborhood evolving policy. The land use and development pattern are consistent with the guidance provided in the community character manual for suburban neighborhood evolving areas like this one. The subject site is separated from the nearest neighborhood by a railroad and the most southern building on the SP is approximately 400 feet from the nearest lot. Um, with a suburban neighborhood evolving policy that's proposed for this, the subject site is an opportunity to introduce some moderate density and suburban housing type. And the proposed scale and organization of the buildings being provided here is consistent with the suburban neighborhood evolving policy. The SP also includes multimodal connectivity by extending the Harpeth River Greenway. Um, and this is consistent with the Metro Parks Master Plan. And this connection again would provide a greenway link from the Warner Parks to the Bellevue Center. Additionally, the plan proposes to improve the multimodal connectivity of Coley Davis Road. Uh, the plan also proposes to improve the vehicle and uh, or the safety of Coley Davis Road during severe rain events by raising Coley Davis Road above the 500 year floodplain. And the plan is sensitive to the floodplain areas on the site by preserving them and proposing to dedicate them to Metro Parks. And that completes staff's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, just a reminder. So we have two items that we're considering, item 12A and 12B. Um, Logan focused specifically on the item 12B, but just wanted to make sure we were thinking about both, both components. Um, so as I said, we, we did keep the public hearing closed. Um, so I think that I will turn this over to Commissioner discussion and we'll try kind of following the model Greg has had lately um, with one person getting us started and others can fill in. Commissioner Clifton. I just had something to start with if you want. Oh, to I would be I'm happy to. No, hurry, no, no, please. If you're ready to get started, let's get started. Thank you. Um, I do think when some of us first heard about the, the plan um, before last meeting and preparing for last meeting, we, we uh, last meeting it was heard, we were um, fairly impressed that this development would take away the obvious problem so quickly, which is uh, building um, up, raising the road so much. For, without which it really couldn't have been considered. Is that is that a fair statement yeah. that, that that is what the first decision was? Otherwise, we wouldn't be thinking about it. And I was impressed by that, too. Um, showed they were serious about it, willing to spend a lot of money to do that. And I may have been a little bit too impressed by that as opposed to some of the details, which is what often happens with me. But uh, but I do have some questions the more I've, I've thought about it. Um, and as I heard some of the expectations that did not come to pass, frankly, since we heard it. Some things we thought we might hear that would make it more clear cut and now is not quite so clear cut uh, from CSX and various places. That's a generalization, but that's certainly what I heard. Um, I'm, I'm trying to start with the issue of the plan. Um, when I read that it's currently uh, suburban, what is it? Conservation? Is that what it was? I'm sorry. Yes. The policy on the site is currently rural maintenance. Rural maintenance. Me too, rural yeah. maintenance. Okay. And we're going from that to, um, to T3 suburban neighborhood evolving. So it's a fairly fundamental change. Um, what are the positives in general for that kind of a change for us? And, and this 
border area, I mean, almost into the next county. We'll bring someone up from community plans to talk about the community plan amendment. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, commissioners. So in this case, um, the benefits, you know, primarily to entertain another policy change, especially a jump in transect, it means that they needed to build a bridge to connect with Coley Davis, right? Um, the bend itself today is isolated, if you remember, and it's accessed through a driveway at the end of Morton Mill Road. And so in this case, um, the benefits are not only all the public benefits we mentioned before, you know, the Greenway connection, conservation of the floodplain, um, having access to the new park that's next door, but also providing uh, housing for the nearby center, the larger Bellevue Center there, and just providing, uh, you know, some more control with Rays and Coley Davis, as you mentioned, Commissioner. So all those public benefits came into play with this, really, in considering this. Um, if they didn't provide that key access point across the river to Coley Davis, it would stay rural maintenance or possibly uh, suburban maintenance building out the attached Morton Mill type pattern possibly, but it would not jump to another housing type as intense as this. Right. It seems like, I guess the other side of that is that um, the current plan, the current use, I mean not use, but the category it's in of maintenance, uh, rural maintenance, uh, it's a big enough, and one could argue that it's a big enough county to still have rural maintenance. And if you were going to have it, you might have it in this fairly remote area. I'm just thinking about these things at the moment. I'm not trying to argue it. I'm also not sure I'm going to vote for it because I think there are some things I was surprised at that didn't really go the way I thought they would in terms of things we were going to find out. I'm, you know, I understand that I'm a huge believer in intensity, uh, uh, where it's warranted. And, uh, you know, like a lot of us, we, we, some friends sort of did double takes when we voted for density at Bellmead Plaza. Wouldn't change that for, for anything. It was the right decision. This is not Bomi Plaza. It's a very different situation. Um, it's, um, I just, I need to be quiet and listen to other people because I'm, I, I want to support something here. I'm just not sure I'm comfortable with, with what I'm hearing today. So, so other commissioners, I, I mean, this is a big item, so I'm happy to go around the room. Commissioner Henley, do you have some, some comments you want to share? Sure. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll start with the plan as well. I think, you know, for the way I'm viewing it, you know, there were material changes in terms of the, the community around this site. Um, and I think those were, those were highlighted. And then also specific to the plan, to the SP itself, um, you know, we would effectuate a lot of additional things that would really change the nature and the characteristics of the site. I think the the rural component of it and, and the maintenance component of it was what I recall hearing a lot of, um, I'll say angst about the change is, you know, we're, we're potentially sacrificing areas that, that fit that characteristics for more development. Um, but the thing I also heard is it doesn't mean the site would not have been appropriate for redevelopment. So we're starting to have a conversation now that I think is, is about the level of intensity for development. And it, to me, you know, the numerous conditions that we've placed, um, they form a very narrow window for you to fit through to, to make this development happen. I think to me that makes it more appropriate if we're able to, you know, make all those conditions a reality. Um, I share the sentiment. I mean, the, the thing that really took me aback was the elevating of, of, of the roadway and, and potentially impacting, you know, the lives of residents that are already there. Um, 
It's interesting to see kind of what it seemed like was a little bit of waffling from um, CSX, but I, I've worked with CSX before. They do have some stringent, some stringent language, but it seems like they're still open. It didn't seem like they said no. It just seemed like there would, there would be further conversation. At, at this point, I think the the change in the plan. I, mean, I know we do it kind of the other way. The change in the plan happens, um, or the, the, the SP is conditional on the change in the plan. But here, I'm almost. I feel almost the other way. If if we're not raising the road um, and we're not potentially adding the, I don't know if it makes sense to change it from rural maintenance. I mean, I kind of heard it the other way. I don't, I'm probably, I may be unique in that, but that was something that I heard. I, I like these two things together, and that's why we hear them together. I think it makes sense. It unlocks um, the development potential of a site that could be developed. Um, and again, another a fellow proponent for density. So if it's a site that if this was in front of us and it was, you know, half or a third of what's there, I think it's an opportunity to really take advantage of putting something special in this community that's surrounded by park space and now has um, a new community center. Okay, thank you. Um, and just to remind commissioners, we do have representatives from NDOT and Stormwater if anyone has questions. Uh, Councilman Withers, I'm just going to go around the room for this item. <laughs> sure. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll try not. I'll try not to shout at people, but uh, hopefully we can get that volume adjusted. It is a little even for me to hear my fellow questioners. It's a little quiet. So, <laughs> um, well. We had a great discussion at this last time. This is one of those where, um, you know, I, I like to go out and see some of these areas, especially if they're not parts of town that I get to often. And so when I went out there to, you know, go through the soccer fields, and it's a, from that standpoint, my perspective was like, what on earth, you know, how would this, how would this work from that northern access by the soccer fields? But I do think that the uh, the fact that there is a, a very suburban community immediately to the south uh, makes an extension of a suburban policy work here um, because um, we also have some of the staff analysis about surrounding policies and surrounding density and what that uh, broader view of the staff analysis shows to my mind is that this is consistent with the overall uh, kind of bird's eye view of the community in terms of where policies are located, where housing density is located. It's um, very much in line with a lot of that for the general area. And I think that uh, that it is something to consider. I think the um, public infrastructure improvements, one of the things I spoke to last time uh, with regard to raising the road is um, what is the cost of doing nothing, right? And so if Metro, were to, uh, we, we do have flooding in this area sometimes, uh, and the uh, solution to that would be to raise the road. So either A, Metro could raise that road, or we could work with a private developer who is willing to bear that cost. And it makes sense that there is a certain amount of uh, entitlement that they're gonna need to make that economically viable. And so I feel like this, solves a, a life safety issue for the broader community that's further down the road. Um, and it does that largely through private expense, which helps Metro to spend our capital spending dollars on other, other needs in the community, which is good. Um, and uh, another thing that I, I thought was really helpful too was the uh, staff, the slides about the, the kind of the view sheds. Cause you know, you, there's, there's the thought like, wow, these buildings are gonna, really kind of overpower the community. Uh, and I think the, the slides the staff showed about the view sheds were, were very helpful to me that uh, this will be some uh, somewhat at a distance from surrounding houses. And I think we'll, we'll be off in the distance a little bit, but won't be like a looming uh, new skyline in the way that maybe the Bellmead Plaza would be, right? So I think that is um, helpful to me that the, uh, the the visual impact on the surrounding area will not be as great as maybe I and, and others had feared. Uh, and again, I go back to the, the life safety component of raising the road, which helps all of those neighbors. 
I had a real uh, interest in the uh, stormwater analysis, and we, we see that this will have at maximum, I, I believe, and the staff correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, if we had a, a flooding event, that the uh, increase to the potential water level uh, kind of past this site is zero. Uh, and even within the frontage on this site, we're talking about approximately three inches. Um, if, if that were to happen. But so this will not provide uh, increased flooding uh, to the riverfront area um, out, outside of the site. So I think that is very uh, important as well. But, you know, again, for me, I, I, I think when looking at that, that broader policy analysis that was provided about surrounding policies and housing density, that this is, is in line with that. One of the challenges that, that hopefully we will the planning, future planning commissions and uh, planning staff will look at a little bit more uh, with regard to the rural policy is it's not really clear to what extent rural policy supports multifamily at all. And we know that there are places where we do need multifamily and that includes in some of these areas where it might have a little bit of a rural character today where similar, I think, to another side along White's Creek Pike, you can have, you can still preserve a lot of the the tree canopy and things like that on the perimeter of the site and have um, multifamily housing density that is kind of pretty well concealed, relatively speaking, and also provides a lot of good connectivity to, to buses and transit, and in this case, bike lanes. I think this is another example of that. Well, I think we reached the same conclusion, I think, where it is that uh, the way to accommodate the multifamily in a very well-situated site plan was actually to do a, a policy am amendment uh, to a suburban policy similar to that one off of White's Creek and Green Lane that we looked at a, a little little bit earlier this year. I think this is very similar uh, in in scope uh, to that and, and, and is similarly appropriate uh, to add housing density while protecting a lot of natural area uh, and providing, I believe I heard $12 million of public infrastructure life safety improvements uh, and uh, also supporting uh, the uh, One Bellevue Place um, um, Community Center, which does include um, transit service. So I, I think this checks a lot of boxes for me. Uh, and I uh, think that this is a, a very well done plan for a really uniquely situated site. Thank you. I just wanted to do a quick uh, housekeeping reminder that we want to make sure that all phones are silenced. Um, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, since representative from NDOT is here, so I would like to ask uh, some question and reserve my comment afterwards. Is it on? Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. So I would like to ask some somewhat technical and somewhat ignorant questions because uh, this uh, part of the Collie uh, Davis Road will be raised. So I'm reading the report. So the lowest part will be raised as much as three feet. So the raising or improvement parts start uh, where the, I think, existing hotel is and then go all the way past the proposed bridge. So I'm assuming the length is to give gradual uh, elevation instead of three feet and drop. So would you uh, talk to me about kind of average height or how will it kind of generally work in a, just a general term, not technical? No, you're, you're, I'm Devin Doyle, I'm with NDOT. <clears throat> no, you're, you're exactly right. At, at the most extreme location, and, and, I, and, and I'll, I'll be honest, I, I, I didn't recall exactly what the dimension was, but there would, it would be required to be designed to meet highway design standards for vertical, uh, vertical separation and, and inclines. So here comes some uh, ignorant question is, so since you raise that much uh, one portion, you know, because Nashville is extreme weather, so would that be prone to like uh, creating more pothole or uh, do we have to worry about those? Um, I mean, by virtue of the fact that you're widening the pavement, you increase the area that 
could be susceptible to potholes, but but it would be it would be built to our standards. So and our standards are are set such that we minimize, you know, the the um, likelihood of, of, of potholes. But I, I don't I don't think it would it would increase the likelihood of potholes. And so one thing I'm uh, really confused is uh, one of the question uh, condition I think posed from uh, and that is east of the proposed bridge access shall be include 10 foot two way multi use path along south side of the road, a two foot buffer with vertical uh, delineate <laughs> delineate aiders along the travel lane side of the road and contain adequate travel lanes. So that's what I interpret east of the uh, bridge is Coley Davis. So there's travel lane, travel lane, and then 10 foot multi lane. So that would be a two way bike lane and two way pedestrian. That's the way should we imagine? Uh, yeah, I'm Matt Hannibal. I work with uh, Devin at Indot. Uh, yes, that is correct. There's also the two foot um, buffer between, and there would be vertical delineators uh, and in that area as well. Great. So that would be east of the bridge. So what would happen west side of the bridge after across the bridge? Would that be some safety measure? The reason I'm asking is biker is by, you know traveling uh, the south side of the lane and then all of a sudden if we uh, somebody are going home past the bridge uh, Coley Dave's road you have to cross over and then you know continue uh, trip so what kind of safety measure will be kind of provided at that time the delineators are to the west as well um, there are some constraints that are have to we have to kind of work with but that's why we we're working with uh, the applicant team to really finalize the last uh, bit of the cross section from west of the of the bridge but the lineators will be present um, on the east and the west side so so like a sudden death situation will not happen at that time when at the uh, detailed planning phase you will uh, consult and decide every single safety measure yes thank you I think as far as uh, and that concerns, <laughs> it uh, covers my question. So I think, you know, staff uh, read all the condition regarding uh, bridge construction and greenway access and easement and stormwater question and so forth. And I think since last we met, clearly, you know, this plan is a uh, condition was tightened. And, you know, I think one thing uh, I'm going to appreciate uh, the staff and, you know, developer working together. The condition says all conditions are required to meet prior to the final site plan approval. So it means any of those conditions does not meet prior to developer submit the final plan, it will be pie in the sky. So the construction will not happen, permit will not be issued. So in that sense, uh, this is much tighter. So I do appreciate that, you know, all the condition. So here comes the question. So with this, you know, with these tighter added condition uh, all you know the new development will uh, provide benefit to the community and so those benefit will outweigh short term or some might you know argue it will be a little bit you know over a year of inconvenience so that's a lot to you know away so and then this one, you know, were, we were asked to change the community policy from a T2 rural maintenance to T3 neighborhood evolving. I mean, clearly, you know, uh, changing from a neighborhood evolving to, you know, where a uh, landlocked area is not appropriate. But with this bridge, uh, Coming to SP, I think it's something to consider. 
So I would like to kind of think about, you know, uh, specific plan first, because unlike, you know, regular uh, policy change, this one is literally, you know, without this uh, policy, uh, or rather specific plan, policy change will not happen, or policy change would be rather inappropriate because nobody in right mind will have density on the landlocked area. But with this SP comes bridge and improvement. So I would like to consider, um, you know, would that be appropriate? I think, you know, location with the bridge is, you know, less than a mile from major intersection of I-40 and you know, Highway 70. And then with that bridge and with a Carly Davis improvement, it will be walkable to mass transit, you know, nearby uh, right, park and ride. So it offers lots of improvement for sure. I mean, if it's up to me, you know, I'm a bit concerned about uh, where the horses go, because right now we do have horses rumpling around in that you know, de development site. So, you know, I hope some, like a metro park and some developer bring some creative solution to have this, you know, designated a park area to have where the horses can run and then public can you know, meet with the horses and learn about nature. But, you know, that's not our purview. <laughs> so, you know, if it, I think uh, the building uh, placement is somewhat uh, reasonable because a shorter three-story building is closer to existing neighborhood. And a taller one is closer to, you know, I-40. So that placement is uh, considerate. And I would love to see more open space within that developable area, but I understand, you know, it can be um, mediated with adding more landscaping trees around the parking space. So overall, um, you know, I am still kind of debating if this it's like a chicken comes fast or an egg comes fast situation. But without this, uh, you know, SP, I'm 100% sure those improvement is not going to happen. You know, we cannot do anything about Coley Davis being a dead end, because it is. But providing, a, you know, solution to uh, creating flood prone area by raising and providing safety weighs a lot. And also, you know, assurance is, um, I think when we do uh, SP change, we do have process. If nothing happened within four years of the development, uh, we can initiate uh, SP review. And if future commissioners were to decide SP is inactive, at that time, uh, you know, the future commissioner can say, well, you need to go back to original zoning or you need to consider. And then if SP does not happen, at that time, probably commissioner can um, advise other uh, community plan revert back to T2 rural maintenance because without bridge and without extra access, adding density in the landlocked area is not a good idea. So with that, lots of assurance and safeguard, I am willing to give a chance to this SP to give a uh, community benefit. May I, do you mind if I just clarify something I've heard from uh, both Commissioner Johnson and a bit from Commissioner Henley, because I'm, I'm trying to process this procedurally. I don't have a sort of an answer yet, but I think I heard from both of you potentially an interest in voting on the SP, um, sort of, I heard first. And am I, just so that I understand, because I know I'm going to need to give some feedback here, are you suggesting that you think the SP could be reviewed under the current policy 
No. Okay. Because I, I want to say just on, for the record, I do think multifamily is appropriate in rural policy. I think there is work to be done on the materials. Internally speaking, I mean, the staff, we debate a lot the rural policy because often what will happen is uh, rural, our response to um, rural policy is to allow the development to spread out, which sometimes can have the opposite effect of what we want, which is conservation. And so you see here a lot of conservation, and so the development pattern is compact. The staff tends to say that compact development is tends to be more suburban, but the effect can be to protect rural features which I realize is a bit of a weird thing. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding what the two commissioners said, and we don't have to talk about it right now, but just be thinking about it. If you're asking to review the SP separately from the policy amendment, I want to make, no, that's not what you said. Okay, clarify that one point yes. so I can make so, sure the staff can respond. My point is uh, the proposed SP will be only appropriate under proposed T4 neighborhood evolving design, uh, placement, and density, height. I don't think it's going to meet existing uh, T2, uh, you know, rural maintenance policy. So in order for this SP to proceed, uh, the uh, community policy change a must because it's go hand in hand. Got it. So okay. that's why I... I misunderstood yeah. you. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Right. That's my intention. I would, I would just phrase it, in, and hopefully this makes sense, is, you know, we're going to vote as a body to change the policy, and then as a body we're going to vote potentially to then not approve the SP, but then the, the underlying policy is changed. And I think what we're saying is, well, then we want to go back and then change the policy again. And so I said, right, right now, unless the road is elevated and the bridge is there, I don't think the policy change would be something I personally would agree with. And I think that's some of the sentiment coming from my fellow commissioners. It's just the order we must go in. Um, we don't know the answer to, to 12B, but we're going to vote on 12A. And I think that's the concern. In the absence of it. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Thank you. That's one of others. We, we've, my, my time on this commission has been short, although I've uh, been a long time viewer. Uh, sorry. So, um, I, but I think that kind of what this, I think Commissioner Henley said that very well. Uh, we have had, and I, I don't know if this procedurally is, is okay, but uh, at our last meeting, uh, we had uh, a request for zoning that did not meet the policy, but in that case, there was an adjacent commercial policy. And so for that one, we approved a rezoning with, I believe it was called like a housekeeping measure or something like that, that you could do that rezoning. It was really tied to that, but it wasn't an SP, I don't think in that case, but but I guess I'm a little bit more comfortable with saying I can approve this, this SP specifically and a, a policy change to support it, but I'm less comfortable just with a blanket uh, change of the policy. I guess that's what I'm saying. And so I know that we, we run into this a lot on here, but just that's, that seems to be a little bit of a theme that emerges with some of these really unique site conditions. Commissioner Tibbs. And I don't have a lot to add. Um, actually, um, the one of the points that you brought up was something I was thinking about to make sure that because the conditions, you know, it won't, you know, those conditions are still some strict conditions. And I think that that, you know, just because of the process, if those conditions are not met, then it would be disapproved, you know, would not go forward, I guess that's the best way to say it. Um, I was, you know, I think as Commissioner Henley said, I was a little, con you know, CSX flip-flopping, well, that may not be the right way, but a little bit of the change of that was um, disappointing, you know, just because, but, you know, understand that process, because it, it is, and I did, like, especially listening to the conversations about the Greenway, um, and so it seems like there is uh, there is a route to an approval by them, but um, you know that's some of the really community benefit of this whole thing. So um, I do you know want I'm, I'm, I definitely want to make sure that that is something that continues forward. Uh, I did have one bridge question, and this may be an easy question for Dot, but um, and maybe you can answer it and not you can wave or whatever. But when it's a developer maintenance bridge is that i mean do we have like t 
tons of those around the area and that's not a big deal uh, as opposed to because you know 20 years from now things are changed developers gone or whatever and they're ca calling you and you're saying that's not my bridge you know well we do have one example that has has advanced to a formal agreement it's my my understanding there may there may be others but um, and, and it has happened just within the last 18 months and really would serve as the model for the maintenance agreement. I, I, I don't know the details of that, that agreement. I, I was not personally involved in it, but, but it is something that we have accomplished on a separate SP project, ironically. Okay, thank you. So I don't know whoever is making the amendment, uh, making the motion, maybe there's some kind of way to make sure to tie back that you know, so that's, that is not left over. And the only last comment, and then I'll stop talking, is um, I was a, I was kind of looking for a little less density, uh, not a lot more, because I understand, you know, I do feel like there was a, an intentional way to kind of keep more open space. I just, uh, you know, if I could just X out one, I think it would, I would have really liked the view, you know, kind of view back to it to see the horses. But, you know, just I think that would have been a little bit more. So I don't know. And, and more open space that you brought up within it. So then you really have this, um, you know, this 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 uh, development that's really trying des trying more to be part of that uh, property. I would love to have seen not not trying. I know the isolation is good. But at the same time, it's like you are part of this now. So like, like, so embrace it a little bit more. But anyway, those are my comments and I'll wait for a motion. So, director, yes. So the staff and I were just over there. You've raised some interesting questions. Um, so just in terms of the lay of the land, where we are is there's two um, decisions in front of you. The first is the policy change and the second is the zoning uh, uh, review. And so typically, uh, as in this case, what we recommend is um, that if you approve the policy change that you approve the zone uh, request because the staff is recommending that the plan as proposed meets the new policy. Always it is to this body's <laughs> discretion. You have a recommendation from staff, but it's to your discretion as to how you want to interpret the policy. So that's point one. Um, it does take a, uh, a minimum six votes to change the policy. The zoning threshold is different and that's intentional because a policy change is, um, you know, seen as something that is just really for this body, it's a change to the general plan. And so the threshold is very high. And so um, that's the lay of the land before you. I'm sensing that there's an interest in, in having some condition that says we'll approve the SP, but if this SP doesn't move forward, then the policy reverts back to um, uh, uh, the um, rural, um, and we have, to my knowledge, never made a decision that way. And so the staff are talking over there about, about that. I don't know if that has a majority vote, but just since there are several members who are bringing this up, I want you to know we're, we're talking about it. Um, did I ca accurately capture what, and I don't even know how you would reflect that in a motion, because I do think you would need to take a vote on the policy first and then have a discussion about it. Councilman Withers. Thank you, Vice Chair Farr. Um, I guess a couple of things, and one of these really is for Lisa and her team, but just want, uh, since we are approaching the end of the council term, uh, uh, number one, I wanted to confirm the status of whether there is a bill or, or what that status is. So that's item number one. Um, and item number two on the, the council side is that if for some reason uh, this, we were to vote on this today and it were to be disapproved, what path forward does that leave for council member Rosenberg? So that's question number two. Um, and then question number three, I guess, is a little bit more maybe maybe for us and the applicant. But I, 
Uh, I know we have had some discussion that I've heard from commissioners about density and open space and things like that. My view of this project is that it preserves and is surrounded by lots of open space. So I think that that is mostly external to the housing site. I mean, that's the way that I look at it, but I do hear, hear that from my fellow commissioners and, and, it, uh, and it can be difficult to, um, for the commission to design a project kind of from the bench. So um, if, the, if the commissioners were to feel that uh, a little bit of a site plan revision were needed, what would that process look like? And if, I would imagine that would probably require a deferral. What kind of a timeline would that, would that require and how would that be accomplished and, and how does that relate to the council bill process? Okay, so the people that can answer that are right here. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so um, the council bill has not been uh, introduced um, yet. Um, the rules are if this body recommends disapproval, then um, Councilman uh, Rosenberg would have an option to uh, either not call the bill up or he can take it to council and would need to get 27 votes. There would also be a public hearing associated with that uh, decision. I think at this point in the council cycle and in the term, we're not at a point where I would recommend deferral. And I don't think deferral, um, it doesn't seem productive at this point in any event. Uh, Lisa, but, do you agree with? But when, but you just said he could take it forward, but if the community plan is not, uh, he could take it forward inconsistent with Yes, with the could. existing yes. policy. So there's two things. The community plan is for this commission, this right. body, to to um, entertain, and that is would be an amendment to National Next. Um, the zone change proposal is us advising council, and right. so that is ultimately a council approval. Whether we disapprove <laughs> uh, the zone change or whether we disapprove the uh, plan amendment or approve those things, it's really up to the council member to determine its path forward. Okay. The, whether you vote to disapprove it just, just changes the count. Um, so apologies, we were still trying to make sure we're giving you good advice on the other question that you asked. Well, thank you, I, I think that's right, but I just, with a lot of public interest in this bill, wanna make sure that everyone understands what that, what that process is, but I appreciate reiterating and clarifying that. To be, to be, can I ask a clarifying question? Council was just asking if, because we're all hearing slightly different things, which tells me that the information is productive, or the discussion is productive. Is there an interest in voting on 12B first? And if 12B fails, then not supporting 12A, is that correct? That is not how we have, uh, done this in the past. Um, so the, ba the, the basis of reviewing 12, I'm looking at my predecessor back there who's probably laughing with popcorn. Um, <laughs> so, so you wanna, uh, so I think if you wanna look at 12B, you have to say what's the basis upon which we're reviewing that plan. Is that, that's the current policy. You haven't voted on a new policy. I don't right. think that would be. So that's what I was gonna. That's what I was gonna say is that the rule that your rules and procedures indicate that you all will review and make recommendations based on the land use policy. And so I think that if you wanted to review 12B first, then you would have to do it based on the policy that is in place now per the guidance of your and, rules. And I, I think if you were to do that, you would need to make a determination that it meets the current policy because there's not a new policy in place. It's your decision. The staff has given you a recommendation that it doesn't meet the current policy. So you can certainly make a different decision, but generally your rules have been that you evaluate these against the new policy. Yes. So, May I ask a question? So, as I said, uh, the I strongly believe a community plan change is worth considering is because of this SP that provide bridge access and improvement of the flood prone area, Cowley Dave's Road. Without that, I strongly believe uh, T2 neighborhood evolving in landlocked area is inappropriate. So, but we must 
either consider a policy change first without this SP or not, or without bridge coming or not. That would be the where we must consider first. It's been an interesting thing to, to listen to and this meeting and, and when it was brought up before. Um, and I started out much more favorable, as you heard me say, and might remember from the last time we discussed this. I um, am not sure how to phrase this, but I don't really think I'm against some of this happening. I think there's a lot of ifs there, and I, I'm just a little skeptical. I don't have a major problem with the council uh, if they cho choose to do this under their rules. I just have a major problem with voting for either one of them today, um, either A or B, because I think I think it's it's a bigger change than I sort of had anticipated, with a lot more uncertainty after the report we got back. So um, I could be totally wrong. Um, I understand that there's different ways to look at density. I don't think of density as bad. We have voted for density quite a bit on this commission, and the council has. This is a slightly different situation um, geographically and population-wise and surroundings-wise, and I see it at least a little bit like a very early decisions when I first got back on the commission where we heard a lot of testimony and, and did not follow this staff rec recommendation um, up in uh, Neely's Bend. Uh, we decided this was a rural area. People wanted it to stay rural. And we unanimously voted against the staff recommendation. And that doesn't mean we were right then, but we did that. And uh, I, uh, I, I can probably be talked into with massaging this a little bit more, getting a little bit more straight in my mind. Um, I assume now we'll keep an open mind if we keep it here. I'm, I'm not prepared to vote for either one of them at this point. So I didn't want to be that to be a surprise. Commissioner Clifton, do you want to make a motion? <laughs> well, it's it's awkward because it may be that the proponents want this decided one way or the other today, and I don't want to stand in the way with a with a deferral. I, I'm assuming that a deferral today does not kill it because of the calendar. We are meeting again. And the council would still have a time to to, to move forward. You're always welcome to ask the council member his preference. I do think my sense here is that a deferral wouldn't be product productive on planning terms. Um, I think, so Lisa, where are we on timing wise? Is, is it fair to say that it would be better for the commission to vote up or down today? Um, right, so from the standpoint of the council calendar, we are sort of um, nipping at the heels of the end of the term. Um, we have bills to be filed tomorrow that will be introduced um, at the first meeting in June, public hearing in July. Bills will also be introduced in the first meeting of July, public hearing in August, which is the sort of drop dead um, last um, council public hearing. I'm not sure, I mean, there is still time, but if there was a deferral, I would think that there would need to be very clear guidance as to why it was being deferred because we've sort of gotten the additional information that was requested. And so I'm not, I'm not certain what else could be gained. There's probably time in the council calendar. I'm just not sure what else we would do from a planning standpoint. I, th I thought we got mixed messages from what we were expecting in the last deferral, but that's just maybe the way I heard it. If there were, and, and we would be happy, I think Logan would be happy to answer any questions that you had if there was anything in the information that was provided that that you felt like wasn't a um, clear answer, I think we would be happy to, to answer those questions. 
I was referring not to something that we're getting mixed messages from the staff, but but from CSX and others. I'm not sure how mixed it was. I don't know that they had ever come down early saying, yeah, we can do whatever you say. Uh, it's just things like that that I, yes. I, I just can't can, wrap do you, my head around. Do you want to go back to the this slide right about um, the, with the response that you got from the Yeah, I'm So I think that... Um, so this was the information that we had gotten back from CSX. Um, there were two options for a crossing on CSX. One would be tunneling, one would be going over. Um, CSX has, it has indicated that they may not be supportive of one of those two, but that the other two is an option. Staff was recommending leaving both options in case CSX policies change, but there is an opportunity for at least one of the two options um, to, to be functional. I think it's an, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll be happy to make a motion just to see where people are uh, on it, and then we can vote for a different motion if it doesn't. Well, Commissioner Clifton, I guess what I would say is if, if there are specific things that need to be clarified, the staff want to, to do that. I haven't perceived that during this discussion that there were additional technical questions, but if I have misread where the body is, then I am happy to list uh, CSX. I wish I could tell you that I thought a CSX person would come to the meeting and answer questions. I don't think that they would, but, but if there are items in addition to CSX that the commission would like to hear from then, um, or like to learn more about, I'm happy to put that on the table and defer another meeting. I think you're hearing that Lisa, that we can, we have a little narrow amount of time that we can do that. I think I heard CSX and I also heard a comment from Commissioner Tibbs about the amount of density on the site. And so those are the two things that I heard. If you wanted to entertain a deferral. Well, can I ask one question? This says that CSX is willing to review a proposal that includes construction of the Greenway Trail. Um, should they come back and say they're not supportive of that, then there's no Greenway access, right? If CSX was not, and if they were not able to approve a Greenway crossing, then the SP zoning wouldn't be able to move forward as a condition that staff is recommending and CSX has made it clear that they're not interested in confirming the availability to do something without going through the necessary permitting processes that include fees and, and timelines and uh, an official permit. So this is essentially as far as CSX has been willing to go related to a project that doesn't have its zoning in place yet. So if CSX came back and said, neither option works, then we have a condition in the SP that would say this SP is no longer in effect. Yes, the, the project can't move forward without providing the Greenway Crossing, so they are required to coordinate with CSX and receive their approval for a, green, for a Greenway Crossing to move forward with the project in addition to the other conditions like raising the road and providing the bridge. But because of our process, we would have voted at that point to put the new community plan mm -hmm. in place. Mm -hmm. Okay. I only want to say that I think you said my comment the best, designing from the bench, you know, so I, I wouldn't, it would be something that maybe council can, you know, maybe they can talk about a little bit later, but I, I, I don't, I wasn't enough part of the problem. That was just my comment that I thought would be uh, but I wouldn't call it a deal breaker. Maybe I should say it that way. Just if, if, if I was as a designer, I, I would look at it that way. But there's so many other variables. So designing from the bench was a, a good comment, I thought, of council. Other comments? Okay. Um, my very last comment, I okay. promise. No, it's okay. Um, it, it's, again... I, I'm still tied to the policy. I, I, the SP, I, I can show my hand. I feel comfortable with it under the policy that we're considering. Is there a, is there a way where the the staff and or the council member can come back 
regardless of what we do. But if it changes, that it can be back on our agenda to, yes, to put it back to where it was. Uh, I think that would resolve that would resolve my qualm. And so I'm just curious if that's an option. The commission could require the staff or the project uh, be reviewed at final site plan, uh, which is typically delegated to the staff, but you could require final site plan review. And if you were not satisfied at that point, uh, you could revisit the policy. How would, how would we do that? Well, so typically um, you review um, the, the preliminary and then you delegate to the department the review of the final. And so you are, could withhold that authority to yourselves. So you'd have an opportunity to have a public hearing and all of those things associated with the final site plan approval. And if it's not satisfactory to you, then at that point, um, you know, you would have an opportunity to, um, you know, review the plan. And I suppose at that point, give the staff some additional direction about the policy as you are always able to do. But that is an unusual move, but you can certainly do that if you feel that that would help uh, have a productive decision here. For, for clarity, that's not what I'm asking. Okay. What I'm asking is gavel hits and then gavel hits on 12B and we don't like that the decision we made happens. Can either the staff initiate as the applicant or the co council member initiate the applicant to immediately change it back? Like to change the what back? The policy change back. The policy back. That's all I'm asking. Back to Back to what it was before we made the change. And the purpose of that would be failed SP, failed project. I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is, my fellow council member, my fellow uh, commissioners and, and council member have stated we are, we just don't want to put a policy in place that doesn't seem appropriate without these public infrastructure improvements. So if we then know immediately after that those infrastructure improvements are not likely to happen, I think we would all feel that the policy change would should be reverted. So I wonder if. So it would be helpful to think about um, recent work we have done on the East Bank or in Midtown, where we evaluated policies and supplemental policies based on infrastructure recommendations that either the public or the private sector was going to need to accomplish. And we made those recommendations based on the vision set forth in some instances by the department or in other instances by the private sector. And our intention was made clear with that policy change that those capital investments needed to occur. And so I, I, I can appreciate why this feels a little bit different in the sense that it's um, more landlocked than some of those other policy areas, but it's not unusual for the commission to entertain different policy areas based on infrastructure improvements or investments. Commissioner, you can always come back and ask the staff to evaluate policy. But at any time, it is your, your discretion to do that. I, the reason I mentioned the final site plan is because that is a trigger that you could put in place. But at any time, a commissioner uh, can um, give direction to the staff, usually in a forum like this. So what I'm hearing, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Councilman Withers. Thank you, Chair. This is a really, really good discussion. Um, I want to make sure that I'm clear and I think the public are clear as well um, on this. So um, if we vote to recommend approval of this SP and it goes through council, um, there and, and some of the conditions that are attached to it are not able to be met, such as a CSX Greenway connection. If that condition is not able to be met, what happens? The SP does not move forward. Does not move forward. And so you have to go, we have to go back over. It, yeah. it is, it's a specific condition in the staff report. It will be a specific condition in the council bill right. that says you have to build this greenway mm -hmm. for this project to happen. So if a final site plan comes in and CSX says you cannot build that greenway, then we say we cannot approve your final site plan. Right. It would have to be amended. It'd have to go back through this process, back, back through council yeah. to remove that link because it's a specific condition, as Logan explained, in 
the staff report and would be in the bill as well. And, and similarly, so um, let's say that that happened. Let's say that it was not able to be constructed for whatever reason. We would have this T3 suburban neighborhood evolving policy here. What, but, but the zoning is the SP and the zoning cannot be constructed without a, a change. So I guess what I'm getting at is there's not a risk necessarily that unlike say a base zone change, there are no entitlements at that point. So no one's gonna be able to come back in and put in a large multifamily project here under any entitlements because no matter what, they would still have to come back through the commission and the council to obtain new zoning. And that gives me a little bit more comfort in this particular case, I guess, and maybe, I wonder how others feel, but, but we're not doing a base zone change. It's not gonna be like RM40A or something like that, it, where someone could build an apartment complex it, without doing the conditions. Right, it's not a base zone change. And the way that it's written, approve with conditions, disapprove without all conditions, means when we send the legislation over, if, it, if you all were to make a positive, res, res, um, positive recommendation, when we send the legislation over, it would include all of those conditions. If at any point in the council process, someone amends it to remove a condition, then it becomes a disapproved bill. bill. And then it has to get 27 votes, the, the, vote, th the vote threshold changes. Um, but it is, all SPs, every SP that you review have conditions that are tied to it that include traffic improvements based on what's being proposed, um, greenway improvements, uh, material restrictions, height standards. They have to meet all of those things or they can't get final site plan approval. I don't, right. I don't know how else to say it. Well, thanks for that clarification. I mean, like I said, there, there's not a base zone change that's gonna allow multifamily without you know, doing some of those conditions, uh, all of which are extensively enumerated uh, here. So that, I, I, I kind of get where Commissioner Henley, I think is coming from. It's, you, you do worry about having exposure of having this policy that's sitting out there and who knows what's gonna happen. But because we have this SP that has all these conditions, essentially if those conditions aren't met, there are no entitlements at all without coming back to the commission and the council. So that does give me a little bit more comfort uh, in this case. One other thing I'll, I'll say as well, I'll, while I have the mic, I guess, um, is that uh, I'll go back to, in, in terms of re reviewing it against the present policy, I'll go back to what I, what I stated a little bit earlier is that um, we, we do have areas, I, th I think the Whites Creek is a very similar, we, we do have areas where there is a rural policy for, for some reasons that are kind of good reasons, um, but they are, but the geography of it is really in close proximity to major uh, major highways, major infrastructure transit. It really is a good place to have some kind of a multifamily that you wouldn't want to have way out in, in the middle of a rural area. But, um, but based on the geography uh, of some of these sites, it does make sense. I think as long as it's well uh, situated and, and well um, shielded, I think with uh, green space, which this one is. so. Um, I, I think for me, this is something that I would hope that uh, maybe is articulated a little bit better in the rural maintenance policy to say you can have something like you can have multifamily as long as the minimum site is this many acres and as long as you have this much of a tree save, you can do multifamily, right? I think there are ways that we can eventually get there. We're not quite there yet, but this is at least the second case that I've had recently where it's something like this, where you are able to, where it is adjacent to a lot of suburban policies, which this one is. Um, it is a large site, which this one is. It does provide uh, a lot of tree saves and natural green space, which this one does. And it provides transit connectivity, which this one does. So that I, I think is um, probably where the rural policy will go eventually. But I I've tend to find that um, the, the, the way that this is situated to remove the, the housing from most view sheds, I, I believe does pr protect significant portions of the rural character that uh, is intended by policy. So I am not as gifted as several of you in summing up various things. Um, um, but I, I do think it's probably up to me to make a motion and just see where you are with it. I can't enumerate all of my lack of ease about some of this. Uh, I, I am somewhat skeptical about about the even the 
the the appropriateness of really okay never happened before uh i mean i'm not saying they're, they're making it up i'm just saying i don't usually have that problem i'm just saying i am not positive that i can vote for the zone change or the plan uh i may be able to be satisfied if if people bring modifications to the next meeting or better explanations than I heard, uh, but I just can't vote for that. I didn't know what, there were only going to be six, and I'm not particularly thrilled in standing in the way of something, but I'm going to move uh, that we defer for one meeting both of these items and see if uh, the poor people out here who are, are hoping to convince us one way or the other can make it clear enough to us <laughs> so that I can, uh, so that we can all cast a, a more certain vote the next time we get together. Is that too, no, that's too unclear? It's that's a proper motion of a one meeting deferral. And, and it does give us time in this term for it to be passed. Is there a second? If no second. Let me say I'm sensing that there is a support for the SP. Um, if the commission, but there's not going to be support for the, the policy amendment. And that's smelly fish on the table. So um, the deal is if the motion for A fails, the staff recommendation is gonna to be to disapprove the SP. You can override us, but you need to really make a determination that it meets the current policy. If you don't think you can do that, then we need to defer. So. Um, that's, that's, I'm sensing the SP would be approved, but we can't get there based on the staff recommendation. So you would need to find a way. So can I hear whether that the commission is going to look at the SP against the current rural policy? If the answer is no, then we need to defer and get more information. So can we have this whole conversation while we have a motion on the table that has not been seconded or do I? Okay. Motion failed, and we're back to discussion. Sorry. <laughs> so effectively, because we barely have a quorum, without a unanimous vote, it's disapproved anyway. Right? I think that's our... The policy is disapproved. If you want to entertain the SP, and I sense that you do, if this policy fails, you would need to evaluate it under the current policy, which is rural maintenance. There are plenty of arguments that this meets that policy. Staff did not make that argument. So you would have to make that determination on your own. If you are supportive of the SP and you don't want to go down that path, then my advice is to defer. If you do want to go down that path, it is to your discretion. I don't have a sense of that from the commission here. Director, I have a question. So. As of right now, we do need a six vote, positive vote to pass a major community amendment. And it's not happening, and so therefore, SP will automatically fail. And if that's the case, and a district council member bring that bill to the council, all the condition stays? The SP doesn't automatically fail. The staff recommended, well, the staff would recommend that you disapprove it. It's to you, your discussion. I mean, you, it's your decision. Um, right, vote on each separately. So yeah. each requires a separate vote. And I understand what the hang up is because you, uh, because of the order, but each would require a separate vote. And the SP would not fail just because you voted no to the policy change. But she's saying if you want to consider the SP, you need to articulate that with the current policy, why it meets the policy, why you're approving based on it meeting that current policy. And the SP does not require the same vote threshold. It's a different standard. So, so we would have to make the argument that the SP is consistent with the rural maintenance policy, which is intended to maintain rural character, balancing rural countryside, and existing rural development patterns with new residential development. So, so yeah, I've given you two choices. If yeah. you, so you can, I, I believe that I, be, I um, might ask the councilman his views depending on where we are, but if you um, 
I, I think he could have a, um, a view on deferral, but I think it's important to make sure you understand the distinction between the vote on the SP and the vote on the policy. Yeah, I, don't, Commissioner I, don't, Henley? I don't see the council member coming up to speak, but I, I guess what I would prior to make, because I'm going to make a motion, prior to making the motion, I think it seems like there's the opportunity for the commissioners to engage with staff directly, maybe council as well, to really understand this. And so with that being said, I'll move for a deferral. Second. Commissioner Henley? Second. Okay. So motion on the table is for one meeting deferral. Is there guidance that we need to give staff for this one? Staff, I will give you a call so I can make sure I fully understand what's going forward. I think that's part of my motion and, and something I intend to do. We'll follow up on the technical information provided in the report um, around CSX, what happens if the CSX doesn't move forward, and any other feedback? Yes. Councilman Withers. Because we've had this a little bit before um, and with multifamily, and I think I, I may be mistaken that what was, may not have been a rural maintenance, but maybe the discussion was, I think, for the, the another case that I alluded to was whether multifamily was appropriate in rural neighborhood center. That may be what I was thinking of, but maybe if uh, staff could provide uh, a little bit more guidance about what they feel, uh, to what extent they feel that rural policies generally can support multifamily, and if so, under what conditions? Maybe that would be some additional guidance. to bring guidance. that forward, yeah. because I would argue it can, and yeah. that's, a re that's important. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful for our discussion next time. Perfect. So we have some guidance to staff. My May I add yes. one question? Because as of right now, I strongly feel uh, T3 neighborhood evolving with landlock area is not appropriate. But uh, if staff has some technical idea why T3 neighborhood evolving itself in this particular location will be appropriate, I will be interested to hear. And I just want to make sure we do say public hearing is still closed for the record. Yes. Okay. So I think we have everybody's marching orders up. Okay. Council's advising that we need to vote deferral on both items. Is that right? Council? So Commissioner Henley will go back and we will start with item 12 to defer a. item 12A. Do I have to? Yes. So I can make a motion to defer item 12A. Do we have a second? Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Right. Okay, motion carries. Um, next item 12B. I can make a motion to defer item 12B for one meeting. Second. Any other discussion? Uh, and, and for Commissioner Tibbs, we will make it clear that the public hearing is still closed. Um, all in favor? Okay. And then opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Um, okay, guys, we're at six o'clock, our two hour mark. Um, but we have a lot of cases to go. So do, do you guys need a little break or do you want to try to get through a couple cases? Get a little more done. Okay. Okay, we'll give it a minute for the room to empty. We have a fairly lengthy agenda to go. So if I could ask people to take conversations out into the hallway so we can continue, I would appreciate it.
Um, we have an update on the agenda. It would be great to talk, call on Lisa. Sure. If everyone could, sorry, quietly leave. Um, yes. So we have an update on item number 36. 2020S207003 Chandler Reserve. Um, the applicant has requested that item be deferred one meeting to the June 8th meeting. Number 36. Lisa, can you repeat that one more time yep, number so the folks in the audience can hear? Yes, number 36, 2020S207003 Chandler Reserve. The applicant has requested a one meeting deferral on that item to the next meeting, to the June 8th meeting. I make motion to uh, defer item 36, one meeting. Second. <laughs> Aye. Okay. Motion carries and item 36 is back on the deferred list. Um, okay, give it half a second more so everyone can hear. We will move forward with item 14. Okay, good evening. I'm Eric McTravers presenting item 14 on the agenda. This is a request to amend a specific plan on 1.19 acres properties located at the southeast corner of 19th Avenue South and Division Street to permit hotel use and to permit a maximum of 420 units comprised of multifamily residential units and hotel rooms. It has a staff recommendation to disapprove. The existing zoning is specific plan mixed use, which is a zoning district category that provides it, uh, for additional flexibility of design and to provide the ability to implement the specific details of the general plan. This specific plan includes residential uses in addition to retail uses. The policy is T5 center mixed use neighborhood, which is intended to maintain, enhance, and create high intensity urban mixed use neighborhoods with a development pattern that contains a diverse mix of residential and non-residential land uses. Uh, T5 MU areas are intended to be among the most intense areas in Davidson County. The site is also within a special policy area in the Midtown study. The special policy for T5 Center Mixed Use Neighborhood Area 2 includes specific guidance on building form, vehicular uh, pedestrian connectivity, and intensity. Here's a look at the proposed amendment, and on the next slide I'll detail how it's different from what's approved. So as approved, the SP currently permits a maximum of 420 multifamily residential units and a maximum of 24,000 square feet of non-residential uses. Permitted non-residential uses include restaurant for full service, restaurant takeout, general office, and leasing sales office. The building has been constructed and is consistent with the approved SP and is occupied. The proposed amendment would add hotel use to the specific plan and maintain the existing maximum number of total units to 420. A maximum of 420 of the 420 multifamily residential units could be converted into hotel uses. So, for example, the applicant may like to convert 200 units into hotel occupancy, leaving 220 multifamily residential units. The SB amendment will maintain a maximum of 24,000 square feet of non-residential use. So, hotel use is defined in the zoning code by two distinguishing criteria. Uh, one, that the principal use provides for that the structure can accommodate, quote, occupancy for transient persons for lodging, end quote, and that it accepts on-site reservations for accommodations. So regarding the first criteria, the building will be required to meet building codes for hotel use. The base building construction would not change, but improvements to the building's interior and systems would be necessary prior to any issuance of occupancy permits for the hotel rooms. And regarding the second criteria, hotel rooms will be available for reservation on site and on demand at a check-in counter in the existing non-residential space. The applicant has not provided details on where or how hotel units will be cited in relation to multifamily units. So the T5 MU policy is intended again to be one of the most intense in the county outside of downtown Nashville, or excuse me, downtown area, uh, and to include uh, Nashville major employers as well as residential, commercial, and service uses uh, to create a lively mixed-use neighborhood. Um, this portion of Midtown is well served by transit along Broadway and West End. 
Um, staff finds that while hotel uses can be appropriate in this policy, T5MU is intended to be primarily residential and the SP was approved uh, originally to provide needed multifamily housing in an urban neighborhood. Converting this building to hotel use would negatively impact housing availability. And additionally, staff has concerns regarding the location of and compatibility of hotel uses with multifamily uses within the building. It could be possible for long-term leaseholders to have hotel rooms surrounding them. So for these reasons, staff recommends disapproval of the request. Thank you. Go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is the applicant here? I think you know the drill, but you have 10 minutes. You can save two for rebuttal and start with your name and address. Good afternoon, good evening, commissioners. Uh, Quan Poole um, with Holland and Knight. I'm here on behalf of Connect Nashville. I would like to reserve up to two minutes of my time for rebuttal, uh, if possible. Um, so Connect Nashville has been in this facility uh, for almost two years operating uh, I think they've been a great steward of the community. Um, they, this, and just one thing I want to point out, this was always the plan. Uh, back when they first got the SP approved at that time, um, there wasn't a separate uh, use or distinct use of non-owner occupied uh, short-term rentals. And so a couple years ago, they came with a similar request, not the exact same request, uh, to convert some of these units for like a more transient use. Uh, and so it's it's not often that I come with a, a bill where staff has recommended disapproval, but I think it's appropriate in this case. Uh, one of the reasons, and you know, I'm reading from the staff report uh, that was drafted on October 14th of 21, which is about a year and a half ago. And in that staff report to this body, uh, they they recommended that that use uh, did meet the policy. Uh, and and quoting specifically from the 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 uh, staff report at that time, it says this portion of Nashville is intended to be among the most intense in the in the county outside of the downtown area and include and to include both Nashville major employers as well as residential. Um, the staff finds that this the intent of the T5 mixed use policy is to create an intense mixed use district with a diverse mix of residential and non residential uses. And so the land use policy for this site since that uh, report was made about 18 months ago hasn't changed. And so we think the proposed use uh, for hotel use does meet the land use policy. Um, within uh, a mile of this existing hotel, uh, I mean, excuse me, this uh, site, there are eight hotels. There's the Hotel Frey, the Embassy Suites, the Hilton Garden, the Virgin Hotel, the Hutton Hotel, the Aloft Hotel, the Courtyard Marriott, and the Graduate Hotel. So just within this site, there are eight different hotel uh, locations that offers a, a very similar use. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that although the, the application involves an ability to convert all of the units, uh, that is not the intent uh, of the applicant. Um, at most, at any given time, we'll, if there will be 20% of the units used for hotel use. Their primary model is to incorporate long-term leases, which uh, in most cases is 12 months or more. There are several connect uh, properties throughout the country, and what they offer is the ability for their uh, guests or tenants from other properties to come and stay at neighboring properties, whether it be here, whether it be Phoenix or, or Arizona. And so there's a gap there. Uh, there's a gap whereby... Um, people or tenants from other uh, facilities uh, can't come and stay for a shorter period. Uh, the way the zoning code is defined, any stay less than 30 days is not allowed. And so they anticipate uh, that the average stay will be about four to five days. Uh, so what th they're not targeting the market of what you would think of a traditional short-term stay. Um, it, it's, it's merely a bridge to allow people to come Oftentimes, it, it, it'll be Monday through Friday. They won't be here on the weekends. Um, but, but that is what they anticipate the average stay will be. Uh, an, another thing that they, they plan to do is to, to run background checks on all of the guests. And so if you go to their property, you'll see this is really a sort of a, a WeWork model. It's a, a co-leasing space. And so they really have a brand, and they want to do everything that they can to protect that brand. So they're not going to allow guests inside the space 
unless they go through the same stringent requirements that they have of their tenants. Um, and so for those reasons, they're not going to be able to turn over those one to two night stays because those, those guests won't have time to, to go through their background check po uh, policy. Um, the, the other thing I think is important to, to, to point out is that this property has three bedroom units. None of the three bedroom units will be used for uh, hotel use. Um, on average, the units that will be used are between 300 and 500 square feet. So these really are micro units that are more akin to a hotel style use, not what you would think of, you know, a traditional uh, party pad or, or anything of the sort. Um, uh, a few other points to make is that um, right now, because it, it was mentioned in the staff report about the, uh, the, 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 the impact to the housing stock. Connect Nashville is operating at about an 85% um, uh, capacity right now. So they've got about 15% vacancy. Uh, they can't fill those units. And so when they, the, when they originally came uh, before the board, their market plan was to include about 15 to 20% of this, I'm saying short-term stay, not, not meaning short-term rental, but those short-term stays. And so lo and behold, the market has kind of bared that out. They can't fully stock this, uh, this facility because they really rely upon the ability to get in uh, those residents about 15%, 15 to 20%, which are going to be, um, which will make up the full uh, makeup of the building. Um, it, the only reason that we have requested all the flexibility to convert all the units, it's, it's mostly a permitting issue. Uh, I mean, if the, if the commission felt it was more appropriate to limit that to 20%, they're willing to do it. But, but the way you have to permit a hotel, um, as Mr. Matravers uh, indicated, is you have to make modifications to the size of each unit. And so what they're prepared to do, there's, it's going to be a significant cost. But what they would rather do is just go ahead and do the whole building, uh, even though 80% of it is going to be a long-term stay, if they had a, a guest checkout, they can bring another unit online and then convert one of those. And so in order to have that flexibility, uh, they're, they're willing to uh, just redo the whole building to accommodate the standards. Uh, if, the, if the commission feels it's more appropriate to, to limit that number to 20%, again, we'd be willing to do that. Um, uh, the, the other thing I'll point out, so they came, when they came from this for this 2021 request, uh, the commission didn't vote for approval on that. I think there were a number of of guests who were here in opposition to that request. And a lot of them came from the Adelicia. And so the, the commission heard those, um, uh, heard their thoughts and didn't approve that bill. I don't know how many people are here today, but I think it's significantly less than, than what was there before. Um, and, and I'll close by just saying, uh, we toured this property with, with a lot of the, the residents in the area. And I think you really have to see it to get a full uh, impact of the facility. They, they truly see it as a brand and they don't want to do anything to disrupt that brand. And uh, when walking through, you see young uh, professionals, developers working on the apps. In fact, uh, the two times that I visited the facility, I ran into a lawyer who was leasing space there uh, as well as an architect. So I think it's, it's outside the frame of what you would traditionally think of. And so because of those things, they're going to be very intentional in how they use this and how they take care to make sure they continue to be good stewards of the, of the community. Uh, I do want to reserve a little bit of my time for rebuttal. And so if you have any questions, obviously happy to answer those. Um, but uh, I look forward to hearing your, your debate on this item. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we will open up this item. Um, is there anyone here speaking in support of the project? Seeing none, anyone speaking in opposition? You would like to come forward and you will have two minutes and please start with giving us your name and address or five, five minutes. Okay. Okay. He's just passing out a copy of what I'm about sure. to read to you. Give him a minute. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Danielle Kaczynski. 
Uh, I'm a homeowner at 1803 Broadway, uh, the Bristol on Broadway. Um, I'm just a good old homeowner that's raising a family there. Uh, I have children in high school, and so that's my background and why I'm here. Um, I'm also on the Bristol on Broadway um, Board Association, and many of the homeowners and the board have asked me to come and speak, not only at the past me meetings, I think they, we've been represented, but today's meeting as well, uh, regarding the application for rezoning of the 2017 SP09 uh, regarding the Connect Nashville. Our community is opposed, <clears throat> our community is opposed to any special plan that would include short-term stay rental buildings in Music Row, the plan area. Um, STSR does not reflect the overarching plan to create a community and would be a detriment to the attracting residents. Short-term stay properties do not support the idea of permanent or long-term residents for our neighborhood. Metro Police have responded to calls on attacks on residents and have limited the ability to pursue the offender because they're likely there from out of town on a short stay, on a short stay rental. Excessive noise, trash, illegal parking, vandalism, increased traffic are some of the problems that the neighborhood will be exposed to if short-term stay rentals are allowed. The corner of 19th Avenue South and Division Street is one of the most dangerous intersections for pedestrians. Many short-term rental stays are targeted by human trafficking for, for use. Anonymity is much easier than it will be with a monitored hotel or motel. Uh, and there are links to those statistics. Uh, our board president met with the leadership of Connect and they explained their wishes to be to have SB, which included STSR status. I'm out. Okay, that's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Speaking in opposition? Absolutely. Okay. Um, it's unclear if I have five minutes as pre Okay, thank you. Kevin Warner, um, property owner and president of Scarrett South Homeowners Association. Thank you all very much for this. I can say painful because I don't answer anybody but my wife, but it's a very difficult job that you all do. I seriously appreciate what you're doing. Uh, we all know that um, a um, reputable and respected Vanderbilt professor opposes the application. Now, her, her email is in the file. She is convinced that uh, Nashville needs more affordable housing, not short-term rentals, hotel rentals, whatever you want to call that, that group of um, commercial property use where it's short term. She's convinced this will disrupt the neighborhoods. As you heard uh, 10 minutes ago, staff in its report wrote, quote, converting this building to hotel use would negatively impact housing availability, unquote. And at your May 11th meeting, when we were deferred, for the second time when I, I decided not to wear my tie tonight, because and here we are, we're on the agenda. At your, at your last meeting, I don't recall who it was, but one of you said, we do need housing. Yes, we need, I mean, everybody who is over the age of one week knows that in Nashville. <laughs> now, I, I don't know how well you understood the comments that the applicant made to you just now, but they were, uh, very similar to what some of us heard when we met with uh, a handful of the Connect principals, including a number of people from the Adel issue who cannot be here tonight. I would be offended if I lived in that building and, I, and it was suggested that, well, geez, they're not here tonight, so they don't care. I mean, you've got f letters from people who live there. But when we met with that, those individuals, I was puzzled as they described the number of unfilled rooms they choose to leave empty as part of their plan and the confusing reasons for not addressing 
head on what I think is a money losing reality. And if you got space there, make some money off of it. I believe Connect wants maximum flexibility for future uses, whether that's multifamily, hotel, rentals, STRs, or retail. More flexibility and less specificity. So as their application says, this quote, this flexibility between residential and hotel will provide an opportunity for the operation of the building to fluctuate with the ever-changing market, unquote. What does that mean? What kind of marketing hot air is that? It, I know it doesn't help me understand what they really want to do. And that's, you know, the code is not written to accommodate that, you know. Let an applicant come up and be really fuzzy and go like this and work around the corners, and then when they decide to do what they want to do, then they get to do it. Lastly, Division Street, as you all know and staff knows, is a mixed-use roadway collector. I think that's the appropriate term. The stretch of division in front of this building is a narrow two-lane road. I mean, it's, you know, it's a mess down there. I and others fear that increased traffic congestion on division will become more dangerous than it is now, especially for the students, students who get on and off a public school bus stop at a stop very near this. I mean, I, hell, I don't know if it's 50 yards away, 25 yards away. I, was, I didn't know this till we were down there meeting and I said, is that an MMPS bus? Oh yeah, my son rides that bus, one of us said. That poses a problem in my humble, unprofessional point of view. So how much will all this choke traffic on Division and 19th Avenue prevent ambulances from driving quickly enough to save lives. Please deny this application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Others speaking in opposition? If no others, then we'll bring the applicant back up for your two minutes of rebuttal. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to point out uh, again what the current current uh, vacancy is at the at the uh, site, which is about fifteen percent. They they cannot lease it up um, despite the the current market conditions. The, the other thing I, I do want to point out, and I forgot to mention mention this originally, prior to this rezone to SP, the property was zoned CF, and so they had the ability to build a hotel by right under those existing entitlements. It was in uh, connection with the staff and with the council member at the time that they wanted to add multifamily unit to this area. And so rather than build the hotel by right under their CF entitlements, they, they um, did this SP with the understanding that they would always have the ability to use about 15 to 20% of those units for a shorter term stay. Again, not short term stays, but a shorter term stay. And so it's, but at that point, at that point in time, the the way that uh, short term rentals were defined were changed, and they couldn't do it by right. And so that's why they were back here before you on this request. Um, the, regarding traffic, I know that came up. I mean, I, I do want to point out that these units are already built. Uh, you've got 300, 320 units there, and so whether those units are used for hotel use or multifamily use, I think the the impact on traffic is going to be de minimis. Uh, I, I, I mean, I would probably say that there's going to be left traffic. Traffic, if you've got people who are now using Ubers and Lyfts and those type of vehicles rather than a dedicated car in that parking spot. Um, so um, the previous request was for 200 units. They're, they're coming back before you requesting 20%, which comes out to 84 of the total units. Um, again, here to have to answer any questions, but uh, we, we would respectfully ask for your approval. Thanks. Thank you. We'll declare the public hearing closed and um, we'll try. Whoops. Um, Commissioner Tibbs, do you want to get us started? Uh, sure. Um, 
One clarification about the, um, I, I thought at first I heard all the units and the, the ability to, and then I heard a different percentage. Um, the request was to allow for all of the units. I mean, it, all of the units under the request could be short, could be hotel uses. Okay. That's what I thought. Um, and then, so I would agree with the uh, applicant that it, pro it could potentially lessen traffic. So I, that part of it, I, I do think because, um, you know, just <clears throat> there are people that are live there are going to probably want to drive. And so that, that I do agree with the applicant on that. However, when I was reading through um, some of the staff concerns, um, you know, about the needy multifamily housing in the urban neighborhood and <clears throat> this, you know, our business is really close to this area. And it is a lot of hotels in this area, and there isn't a lot of um, housing. So I, I do feel um, a little bit more of that need to, to the need for that area to have that of our area, I can almost say, actually. Um, so in that aspect, I, I definitely feel like this is <clears throat> I'm a little torn in it. I think I probably would feel better if it was a number, you know, like you can't turn this whole thing into a hotel and then you, cause then you we have a provider and it changes a lot. I probably would feel a little better if certain amount, and I don't know if that's, is that out of policy to say you can do 15% or give a specific percent that could be short-term rental using just going straight short-term rental? Um, so the request is for hotel, which yeah. is slightly different yeah, than short-term rental in regards to the operational characteristics and True. needing to have um, on-site, um, the ability to have on-site um, reservations. Um, I, I think that you could limit um, limit the number. I think that's within your purview if you wanted to. I think one of our concerns was not only... So there's a there's a couple of different things. If the if if when the application had originally come in, because this is a built project now, and so if the when the application had originally come in, there had been a request for two floors of hotel rooms and so many other floors of multifamily, then we could have evaluated that at the time. Um, one of the concerns that we have as staff is if you're looking at a situation where. Unit one is someone that is long-term rental. Unit two could be somebody that's there for the weekend. Unit three is long-term rental. It's hard. It's it makes it, um, I think, more difficult for sort of the um, long-term rental renters that are there. We've we've had some buildings where they have interspersed sort of long-term. This is my home with short-term. Who view it more as a hotel or or something that it's cause it causes conflicts, and so because it was approved as all multifamily, um, you know that's a concern, sort of interspersing, if that makes sense. Actually, that's really great, Lisa. I appreciate that. That I, with that, you know, more um, understanding. Yeah, I definitely feel more compelled to agree with staff recommendation. I mean, especially you bring up a good point too. Like if it was like a floor or and it was already planned that way. I was thinking just the opposite. But if you, if you think of our neighborhood, if, you know, this house is, that house isn't. So, uh, you know, based on what was originally approved and how it was, it was built, and, and especially with the specific thing on wanting a hotel over, even over short-term rental, I would um, agree with staff recommendation. Thanks for that. Okay, I'm gonna try to leave this open, but I imagine most people have a comment. Uh, Council lady. Just one comment. Uh, I agree with uh, Commissioner Tibbs and staff did a really great job explaining why it should not be approved. And one thing that kind of uh, triggered me is a fire code requirement because building is already a building and then fire code re require different fire code uh, requirement based on the usage. So I I'm not seeing how they're going to retrofit to meet this fire code requirement. So I think that's another reason to disapprove this request. Councilman Withers. Thank you, Chair. I'm wondering if perhaps I could ask a question of staff about the zoning history. I appreciate Mr. Poole bringing up that it used to be core frame uh, and um, was 
rezoned, appears to be by Councilman O'Connell um, in 2017 uh, to the current um, the current SP that's before us. Um, would you be able to help us understand the if someone wanted to do multifamily, uh, how this SP differs from what would have been allowed within that prior existing base zoning? Yes. Um, so the property is, as was mentioned, um, or prior to being rezoned to, I'm pulling up the old ordinance, prior to being rezoned to SP in 2017, it was zoned core frame CF, which does permit a variety of uses. It was actually a, a, a mix of core frame and ORIA, oh, wow. which is Office Residential Intensive Alternative. Um, both of which permit um, a, a range of uses. I actually wanted to make sure, hold on just a second, let me check one thing. I have so many tabs open, it's <laughs> quite, quite amazing. Hold on just a second, let me check one thing. So CF, <coughs> Permits. You said you want me to give you a minute? Yes. Okay. Come back to well, me if you don't I, mind. I'm I, sorry. I guess partly I just want to understand why why it was done as an SP originally. It could be for better design guidance. Yeah. I noticed I pulled up the SP uh, ordinance as well, and there are a lot of provisions about you know bike lanes and a lot of things like that that are included. So I can see potentially some design reasons why an SP would have been better okay. than, than base zoning. I got it. Okay. okay. So, so CF does permit residential with conditions through the um, adaptive residential um, mm -hmm. standards of the zoning code. Um, and so CF also permits a, a range of other uses. Um, adaptive residential is permitted where you have the majority of your frontage along a collector or arterial um, and you are within the um, USD, um, Urban Services District. And I actually don't have the major and collector street plan, but that um, may be the, I don't know if the majority of the frontage is on a collector or arterial. But I, division definitely is, but I don't know. Right, but that's not the majority of the frontage. Yeah. The majority of the frontage is 19th. And of course, the layer that I have turned on won't let me look at that. So <laughs> I will get back to you on that. Um, it came in as an SP, and the SP was very specific in that it allowed multifamily residential. Right. At that time in 2017 when it was passed, we did have a use category of short-term rental property, although it wasn't the categorization that we have now where we have owner-occupied and not owner-occupied, but we did have a short-term rental property category. Right. And that category was not one of the uses that was expressed in the SP at the time that it was passed. And so it was approved as so many multifamily units and then a certain square footage of non-residential uses that were on the ground floor. Um, and so the SP as, as passed did not permit short-term rentals, um, even though that was a, it was a use that was um, specific in the code. Um, it, I don't think it was FAR, I'm not sure, I can't, I'm, I'm not 100% sure why it was went that path, but it could have been that it wasn't permitted under adaptive residential. So it's going to take me a couple more minutes to figure no, that out. No, th th that's fine, and that's not fun. Like I said, I was able to pull up the SP. It, uh, uh, at least as you described, it is uh, clear section three of that ordinance that the uses of this SP shall be limited to a maximum of 420 multifamily residential units and a maximum of 24,000 square feet of non-residential as specified in the SP. So, I mean, it, it is pretty clear at that time about what the, the uses were. Um, so I, I'm intrigued with the discussion about whether or not the uh, hotel use would have been um, a, a consideration, but it doesn't appear to, that that was the case in the ordinance that was passed, at least at council. Um, so um, so that, that's helpful. I, I do remember this when, when this was before the commission the last time, and. Uh, that was a question that I had asked actually at that time is to say, well, you know, hotel uses are commercial uses and those are generally supported in, in the, the policy. And do we have a policy reason not to uh, approve the use, at least at that time? And the discussion that we had uh, in, the, in the body is that, you know, we, we also have an ability to look at kind of broader issues. And we definitely have a, uh, I think one of my 
uh, one of the commissioners at the time said, we, we know that we have a shortage of housing, but we do not have a shortage of hotel uses in, in this particular area. And so in looking at kind of broader policy goals of the city, uh, that um, the, the, that request for hotel uses at that time was disapproved. And I just unfortunately don't find uh, that any of that has changed. And so there are, there are some locations sometimes where uh, even STR uses, uh, sometimes you have an area where for various reasons, it's difficult to attract uh, investment. And that kind of is what the market will lead uh, if you're trying to particularly create a, a business district or something like that. Sometimes you have kind of old industrial or things like that and you're, you kind of need something to jumpstart foot traffic, frankly, to, to support um, restaurants and things like that. But, but that clearly is not the case in, in this portion of uh, I guess the midtown community and and so in looking at that broader policy goal as well as looking at um, the the desire of the neighborhoods in that area to kind of control some of the tourism industry as well uh, I'm inclined to support the staff recommendation any comments on this side well as always I, I agree with my colleagues okay <laughs> and I would be prepared to move to adopt staff recommendation. So that is a motion to mm -hmm. approve staff's recommendation of a disapproval. Exactly. Right. Okay. So second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Okay. Motion carries. All right, guys. So two down. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, five substantive ones to go. One more or? Okay. All right, let's go to item 15. Who's our staff person? Oh. Can we get through this one? Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. The time delay on the internet must be longer than I thought because I thought just heard we we're talking about dinner, but okay. Next up on the agenda is item 15, and my name is Logan Elliott with the Planning Department. I'll be presenting staff's recommendation. Um, this is a request to rezone to SB zoning to permit a multifamily development and staff is recommending approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. This is another case that has had its public hearing. This one had its public hearing on April 27th of 2023 and the planning commission closed the public hearing and deferred the item to allow more time for staff to gather additional information. This project just had three items that staff was directed to come back with more information on. The first is the history of the land use policy that's applied to the area. The second's information on the realignment of Sawyer Brown Road and how this would likely be phased. And the third is a presentation from NDOT on the Charlotte Pike uh, mobility or corridor study that was done for this area um, and how that relates to this project and the subject roadways. So the first item, the land use policy, planning staff further research the policy that uh, is applied to the site and to the area. And this was applied during the Bellevue Community Plan Update of 2011. Uh, the C Bellevue Community Plan Update received a high level of community participation. And this area was placed in suburban neighborhood evolving policy primarily because of the varying lot sizes and vacant land that existed at the time. Uh, and this policy was carried forward in 2015 with the adoption of National Next or the comprehensive plan. Uh, the second item, information on the realignment of Sawyer Brown Road. Uh, this would require a traffic control plan to be prepared by the developer and submitted to NDOT for review and approval during the permitting phase, which is a, a later stage in development. And the road realignment construction process would likely require the closure of the Charlotte Pike intersection for a period of time while the safety of this intersection is improved. 
uh, and Sawyer Brown Road would maintain access to Old Charlotte Pike to the north during this uh, construction process. And the timeline of the process is uncertain at this point, and uh, NDOT's standard process aims to limit the time that any roadways are closed associated with construction processes or construction projects. And then third, we've got um, some NDOT representatives here to talk about the Charlotte Pike um, corridor study and how the findings relate to this project and to the subject roadways. Devin Doyle, again, and Dot. Um, I'll try and sp speak briefly, but of course we can answer and respond to any questions the commission may have. Um, at the request of Council Lady Hauser, um, I guess it was about a, a little over a year ago, uh, there, there were a number of concerns that were being raised by the community, uh, the, the, the neighbors in this community, um, particularly as it related to um, a handful of projects that, that were were in the early stages of, of planning and, and programming. Um, and so the council lady reached out to NDOT to, <clears throat> to ask if we could uh, perform a transportation analysis and do, do some, some level of study of the area, looking at capacity uh, issues, looking at connectivity issues, other geometric deficiencies, um, um, multimodal infrastructure deficiencies. And so we, we contracted with one of our on-call consultants to complete what we, and, and you're, 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 if you haven't seen a trend, this is kind of a trend. We're, lo we're looking more holistically at area-wide mobility studies. And so, so over the past year, um, we, we had one of our on-call consultants go out, collect crash data, traffic data, met with the uh, with the community i believe the council lady can clarify that I, I i was not part of the study one of my staff members was and they they identified a number of improvements that were uh that were recommended as development continues to to uh, uh, occur um and, and and be evaluated and consequently approved um uh, a large number of the, the improvements were capacity related, vehicular capacity, widening, future widening of Charlotte Pike. There were some recommendations that came out of there. Um, several intersections were evaluated for future improvements, uh, particularly at, at, at the interchange and, and, and along Charlotte Pike. There were also bikeway recommendations and pedestrian enhancement recommendations that came out of this study. Specific to this site and, and, and this location, um, it did identify the need for uh, roadway widening improvements along Charlotte Pike, but it also specifically identified um, the need for a realignment of the, in the intersection of Sawyer Brown, the, the north leg of Sawyer Brown, with Charlotte Pike, and it recognized that, that the existing pavement widths um, were, were um, substandard for, for the stretch of the roadway. And so as, as a result, as this project has worked with NDOT and planning through, through, um, through its process, we are getting, uh, in, in the opinion of our departments, some significant uh, enhancements to the area. They are, they are proposing to widen a Charlotte Pike to a three-lane cross section. I don't know the exact dimension. My my engineer may may know that, but I know we have uh, we have we have a turn lane at the intersection of Old Acre Boulevard where Traymore Village was built, and there's one to the west, and they're basically connecting those for, to provide a continuous three-lane cross section. And they are also um, realigning the the skewed intersection, which will dramatically improve the uh, the safety and the operation of the intersection. And they are improving the the width of of, of Sawyer Brown from Charlotte Pike to their to their access point. In, in, in addition to that, I, and and and. Matt Hadabaugh can clarify if I if I state this incorrectly, but I believe they are also proposing to to modify the design of their access onto Sawyer Brown to discourage left turns that would subsequently travel the narrow narrower portion of Sawyer Brown towards I believe that's Old Charlotte Pike. So basically, their their access point will will be designed to encourage and deflect traffic towards the intersection with Charlotte Pike. And, and, and Don is recommending approval with those conditions. 
no, no, you're, 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 you're. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Devin. Um, so that that completes staff's update from the April 27th hearing. Um, and again, staff recommends approval with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so as noted, the public hearing was closed. Um, so it is now up to staff deliberations. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, would you like to get us started? Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, I do watch uh, the deliberation on the YouTube. And if I may, uh, could I ask in that representative additional question? So duration of the frontage of this uh, proposal, the shallow pike will be widened. So would that be a uh, cost of the development? Uh, the developer sorry. will be widening. Uh, Charlotte Pike, will, will, it will be widened. It, so, so that a left turn lane will be provided into Sawyer Brown from Charlotte Pike. Charlotte Pike will be widened. So to come to this uh, proposal, uh, I know portion of the old Hickory is currently three lanes, but it turned into two lane. So it will be duration of this uh, frontage of this uh, proposal, it will be all wide onto three lane to provide center left turn lane. Would that be my understanding? That, that's correct. I, and and I, my eyes are terrible. I'm getting old. So I can't read the name of the intersections of the West. I've, I've looked at Wheatfield Way. Wheatfield Way. So there's an existing left turn lane at Wheatfield Way that basically terminates. And then you have the left turn lane that you were referring to in the Traymore Village area, closer to Old Acre Boulevard. This project will widen Charlotte Pike, basically connecting those turn lanes to provide a continuous three lane cross section. Great, and also existing kind of narrow north side of Sawyer Brown Road. It has kind of weird intersection and it's difficult to make a left turn, so it will be eliminated and make it easier to make a left turn. Is that, that correct? That's correct. Okay, and I understand currently where the center uh, street, like a local street, duration of the local street is, I believe, is existing uh, driveway. But because shall being major corridor, you are not recommending closeness to development next to it. So you're not recommending the curb cut to the Charlotte. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I know or followed your question exactly, Commissioner. I apologize. Yeah, I, I think currently there's existing uh, uh, property and then drive cut is where the proposed internal street. I think, you know, extension of that is where existing driveway is. Oh, the relationship of the existing internal sh internal street to the driveway. Yes, but you are recommending not using that driveway widening as ingress, egress for the future development, but instead recommending access through Sawyer Brown. Yes, that's correct. But we, we, I mean, we generally, and Devin can speak this, we generally try to discourage yes. having uh, the access onto the collector arterial if we can have it on a, a local street. Right. Right. That, that, yes, that, that's correct. I mean, minim, minimizing the number of connection points to the, to the major arterials is, is important. It, it, generally speaking, improves the safety and operation for for everyone, motorists and bicyclists and, and such. So one last question is, I think I'm ahead of the time. So when you're widening and realigning uh, Sawyer Brown, is there any way to open that for the local you know, resident? Because existing uh, Oak Haven resident to guide to narrow, you know, North Sawyer Brown Road duration of the construction to take Old Charlotte and then come back to Old Hickory is kind of cumbersome and not only kind of, you know, safety concern. So, uh. so, so, so ultimately the construction plan will, will be kind of a means and methods that will, NDOT, NDOT's permitting office will work with the contractor 
to minimize minimize closures. Typically, what what happens is the contractors will improve as much of the the roadway or constru roadway construction outside of the existing right of way, um, and 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 only when they get to the point to where the construction is to a certain level of completeness at the intersection points, such as where it intersects with Charlotte Pike or where it ties back in. At that point, you might experience some closures, but it, it, it only happens for a short duration of time and only when they're making the changeover from the old road, road cross section to the new cross section. That's greatly helpful. I was hoping that the answer, because I don't want to see duration of the construction, you know, over month after month will be closed. So that will pose kind of safety hazard. Right. Thank and, you. And we'll, we'll, we'll work closely with the council uh, representative at the time to ensure that that's minimized. With that added condition and great improvement, Charlotte, uh, I feel comfortable with uh, this plan. And of course, you know, some people always sad to see more, you know, density open space. But I think based on the T3 neighborhood evolving policy and closeness to intersection and great improvement of the Charlotte corridor, uh, I'm in support of this uh, project. Anybody else have comments to add or want to add? Any further questions? Okay. If, that if there's none, I will make a motion to recommend a staff recommendation to approve with the conditions. That's a proper motion. Okay, second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Okay, motion carries. Um, all right, I think we are close to halfway through, so why don't we take a short break and reconvene in about 10 minutes? Now everybody would like to get out of here this evening. So um, we are going to move on to item number 19. And let's see who has item number 19. Isn't it? Logan. We're gonna keep calling you back. Hey, good evening, commissioners. Again, my name is Logan Elliott with the planning department. I'll be presenting item 19, 316 Homestead, preliminary SP. The request is to rezone to SP zoning to permit a multifamily development, and staff is recommending disapproval of the request. The property is currently zoned commercial service, and the other properties that front on the Homestead Road are also zoned commercial service. Um, there's an existing residential subdivision to the south that has RS10 zoning. Uh, the policy applied to the site is urban community center, which intends to maintain, enhance, and create urban mixed-use neighborhoods with a development pattern that contains a variety of housing along with commercial, institutional, and even light industrial development. Um, and these areas are generally served by high levels of connectivity with complete streets. Um, the site is also within the Dickerson North Corridor study area, which is a small area plan produced by the planning department. And small area plans illustrate the vision for corridors and neighborhoods within Nashville's community planning areas. And on a parcel by parcel basis, these plans steer the appropriate land use, development character, and design intent guided by goals established by community stakeholders. Um, so looking at the proposed plan, the plan includes 23 townhome units that are accessed via private drives. Uh, the units either front towards Homestead Road or onto common open spaces. Um, the units include garages along with uh, some surface parking being provided throughout the site. Um, and the plan includes the improvement of Homestead Road along the site's frontage. Uh, looking at the recommendations of the Dickerson North Corridor study that was completed in September of 2020, um, the, the study includes a conceptual street network map that shows um, existing street connections and uh, potential street connections within the area that would support 
the development intensity that is recommended with the, the study. Um, looking at the subject site, here it's uh, outlined in red in the top left corner and the conceptual street network identifies that Larkspur Drive should be extended through the subject site to Homestead Road. Um, and that the intensity and policy that's applied to the site should be dependent on the infrastructure identified in the in this small area plan. Um, additionally, the the Dickerson North Corridor study describes that uh, the street connection should be added through private development. And staff was also concerned with the condition of Homestead Road and its substandard condition as it exists today. Um, therefore, staff recommends disapproval of the subject rezoning as it does not provide the infrastructure that's identified in the small area plan or the Dickerson North Corridor study. And that completes my presentation. Thank you. Is the applicant here? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, uh, members of the commission, members of the staff. My name is John Michael from the Thompson Burton Law Firm. I represent the property owner for this project, which is Bella Cyrus Development. And on behalf of my client, we wanted to present our request for your recommendation of approval of this proposed rezoning. Um, the short version kind of previewing this is that basically, number one, there's a lot of support for the concept of the development that you see here, which is to construct townhome style residences. I think it's 22 here on the 316 property in this present case. But there is concern, of course, over what's been referred to broadly as the absence of the required infrastructure pursuant to the Dickerson area, uh, Dickerson North area plan. The trick there is we're really talking about the road connection at Larkspur. And, and Mr. Elliott, if it's not inconvenient, if you'd be willing to go back to the gray map near the beginning of your presentation, I know that's not your problem to pull that up, but if you're able, it would be great help. If you're not, I understand. Um, it's still acknowledging the staff recommends disapproval, of course. One of the tricks here is that the actual connection would go through the property located at 310 Homestead to your immediate west of our property at 316. My clients have made an attempt to negotiate and acquire that property, which would put them in a position to assist the city in constructing the road connection for Larkspur northward toward uh, and to Homestead. However, we were not successful in the attempt to buy it. It's been brought to my attention we cannot force them to sell that property to us as we lack the ability to utilize eminent domain. Now, in this room, there is an entity that does possess the legal authority if they want that roadway bad enough to go get it, build it, and I suspect strongly that my client would even be willing to financially participate in that if that was the basis by which this SP could be approved. However, uh, no, we do not. As just correctly stated in staff's report where they've called balls and strikes and they've said, here's what the plan says for that sub area. We want that street connected, and it doesn't do that, and therefore we have to disapprove. It's an easy call for them. They've done their job accurately, perfectly, as per the custom, usually with, uh, especially with our friend, Mr. Elliott. But here, we don't have the legal authority to give you the road you want. Can't do it. So where the staff report talks about they do not intend to complete that roadway, you're darn right. And I do not intend to have a dinner date with Scarlett Johansson this weekend because she will not return my calls and Mrs. Michael would break my legs. Here's the important thing for us to point out. 23 residential units don't drop out of the sky. But with the SP, we can put residential density, moderate de residential density, right along this Dickerson Pike corridor, hundreds of feet away from the intersection. There is concern, of course, about the existing street and its conditions there on Homestead, and that's a reasonable point. But with our work, we're going to be in a position to add more with the right-of-way, assist with the widening of the circle at the existing cul-de-sac at the end there of Homestead, and assist for emergency vehicles so they've got a better turning radius getting in and out of there, school buses, et cetera, to the extent that's necessary. That's not as much of what is contemplated and discussed as a concern in the area study for Dickerson North. However, it is clearly to the benefit if there are going to be any residences at any point in the future along Homestead, whether connected to another street or otherwise. We're joined today by some neighbors from the, uh, from the area among those um, uh, constituents of 
Council members Toombs, Council member Toombs, with whom we've spoken, who do not want a road connection. This will come as no surprise to the commission. You hear that a lot from neighbors. They do not want a road connection at this location, at any other location. They're content with what they have. If more improvements can be made to the streetscape, not just the driving conditions, but also other right-of-way improvements that are required here, we typically think of improvements to the stormwater, uh, maybe someday in the future, more sidewalks even, depending on what courts do with that. Um, we'll be in a position to do that, and not only to help with this project, but because uh, two clicks down on the agenda, the properties at 330 and 332 Homestead are also part of what's contemplated by this group to develop a similar, in that case, 33 unit townhome style development. And we can connect between 316 and its westernmost point and 332 at its easternmost point, all of the right of way improvements even though some of those properties we don't own, we'd be happy to make the improvements in between, as was suggested by staff as a potential help for this cause. So at the end of the day, the commission is left with a tough recommendation of disapproval on accurately identified technical grounds. If that's the interpretation that it is a must, then yes, we're not doing it, so they have to recommend disapproval. The question for the commission, which is not restricted in the same way as staff with regard to those recommendations, I think is this. Is the basis by which we say no to 22 residential units at 316 and 33 more on this other project, a connection of Larkspur to the north that we have found zero neighbors that want, and I will allow the council member to speak for herself, but I have a sneaky suspicion that I have a, have a hunch as to what she's going to say about that connection. Is that the basis by which the commission will say no? I've got a lot of very specific lawyerly engineer oriented details here we will make improvements on um we'll make the adequate improvements to the right of way and into the cul-de-sac uh along the properties for the benefit of the improvement not the perfection of but the improvement of homestead with this project it's also worth noting that in this little area there's been no substantial redevelopment since it may be in my lifetime but at least best we can tell since the mid-70s and if every single CS zoned property or CSA zoned property, whether people are for or against these projects, if they are all held to the standard of no rezonings, if you don't connect Larkspur on a piece of property that you don't own and legally cannot connect, then we guarantee no rezonings and only base entitlements on that street until. And the until is until Metro acquires and this builds, acquires the lot and then builds out the road. Um, I think those are just facts at that point, and they're tricky, and I recognize that the area study is important and valuable, but that element of it kind of sticks all of Homestead, which is all, as Mr. Elliott correctly identified, either CS or CSA zoning, and there's plenty you can do in CS. Is that what we want? Do we want to say no to literally any residential opportunities on Homestead as we wait to see if Larkspur is ever connected? We don't want to connect Larkspur. I don't think the council member does, and I am abundantly clear from our conversations that the neighborhood does not want to connect Larkspur at this area. Um, these properties will redevelop up and down Homestead at some point. If they go by right, then CS offers a lot of opportunities, none of which involve houses or apartments or places where human beings can live with their families. So we humbly, I know I've been a bit pointed in my uh, concerns about the area study here and the road connection, but I really do think this is the rare occasion where we've got a disapproved project and on both, and I know Mr. Shane is going to present, I think, the 330 and 332 projects preview. It's very similar preview. My comments will be very similar, only minor modifications. Um, we think this is a rare occasion where one very specific element of a sub-area study um, puts it to us and doesn't allow any redevelopment for any property owner along here outside of the current base entitlements. With that, we uh, ask to hold the remainder of the time for rebuttal. We respectfully ask your consideration and recommendation of approval. Thanks. Thank you. Um, is there anyone here speaking in support of this item? Anyone speaking in support? Please come forward. You'll have two minutes and we'll start with your name and address. My name is Joan West and I wasn't prepared to do this, but um, I live on Homestead Road and I am for the development, but not for the connecting street. Um, and like he said, all of the neighbors are not for the connecting street. Um, it's homestead. We need to have 
homes there and people. Um, I've lived there for 60 some years, so um, that's my opinion. I hope you'll consider it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Good evening. Um, thank you for your time and your attention. My name is Miad Balai. I live in Franklin, 107 Foxwood Lane. Um, I'm one of the owners uh, for Bella Cyrus, so the developer. Um, I just want to say that I'm, I'm really excited about this project. I think it can be great for Homestead to have residential units there. And uh, we've gathered support uh, all along the street, both from businesses and from the residents, and they are in favor for it. And as uh, John Michael eloquently put it here, we don't own the land next door. Uh, we would work with the city to, to make that connection if we could. Um, but it's also something to say about that nobody wants the connection. Um, with that, I just want to say I hope we can get uh, your favor, uh, you to be in favor of this, and that we can get a positive vote. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else speaking in support? Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you have, if there's more people coming, feel free to line up behind. Uh, good, good evening, Commissioners. Quan Pool, 511 Union Street, Suite 2700. I, I wish there was a way to, to have a, a sort of a neutral stance, not support, not opposition. We, uh, I represent Power Electric, which is uh, the business that's right across the street from this development. Um, my client certainly wants to see uh, the neighborhood improve. They want to see development. They support smart and responsible development. Uh, the concern uh, that exists with this particular property is just whether the infrastructure is there. Uh, he, he runs an electric power company. There are a number of, of vehicles that come in and out of that street, uh, some of them tractor trailers. And so it's a little bit of a tight fit uh, as we sit today. And when you add more vehicles uh, on that sort of narrow right of way, uh, there's some concern that there won't be the ability to, to adequate, adequately um, uh, have both of those vehicles pass through. In, in addition, sort of just on ordinary days, when he has all the members of his company there, they are having to take up the road right now for parking. Um, because there's not enough, it's a shallow right, right of way and there's not enough parking to, to adequately uh, support uh, what's there now. And so for those reasons, while he, he is in support of development of this area, he thinks that a deferral may be more appropriate uh, to have the conversations that are outlined uh, in the staff report regarding the, uh, the, the Dickerson North study and how that density and those uses uh, can be used to to meet the goals of Nashville Next, but also making sure that the infrastructure that's required there uh, keeps up with that level of development. And so uh, that's kind of where we sit, and uh, we look forward to hearing your discussion of the matter. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else speaking in support? Okay. Anyone speaking in opposition? Okay. If you will come, <laughs> come forward. Come forward, you'll have two minutes um, and start with your name uh, and address. My name's Clark Crawford. My wife and I own the uh, commercial building at 319 Homestead. Uh, we have an auto repair shop there. I would like to bring to y'all's attention some of the concerns with this road. Is anybody aware what a wagon road is? It's good for just two wagons, not two cars. At least once a week, I almost get hit on this road. There are semi-trailers delivering stuff, um, and there are just people who um, uh, are just not aware that it's a two-lane road. Uh, the other issue is, is trying to get off of Homestead onto Dickerson Road is uh, quite challenging. Uh, you have the problem with people coming out of McDonald's, which blocks your view, trying to turn either way onto Dickerson Road. And uh, so it, it's, it's a real safety issue. Um, uh, so I just want to bring uh, 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 these concerns as far as connecting Larksdale. Man, that, that, that's a new one to me. Uh, I can see why the people back there don't want it. So 
it's a problem now with what few cars you have getting on the Dickerson Road. Uh, and now all of a sudden you're going to put in 36 more units and 26 more units. And, um, you know, if you don't even, if you don't consider a traffic light, this is a dead deal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Others speaking in opposition? Good evening. <clears throat> Steve Kirby. I own four lots on Homestead Road. Um, I would just like to start. I, I've been in the neighborhood 12 years. We've moved on this road because it's commercial. We like the dead-end street. It's great for our business. Um, starting at Dickerson Road at that intersection with the McDonald's, Dickerson, and Homestead, there's about 11 different functions of traffic going on there, turning in, turning out, turning across the street, turning into our street. It's, uh, it's quite a little busy spot. And from what I understand, we're too close to the next red light to install another red light. There's no sidewalk on Dickerson, so we've got pedestrians uh, making that thoroughfare as well that are in the way. And there's wrecks at McDonald's and Homestead all the time. I've seen them as far as jumping the road and then the corner off slots uh, parking lot there before. But anyway, uh, our concerns is the same thing Clark said. You know, we have uh, no red lights, there's wrecks intersections, no sidewalks on Dickerson, no sidewalks on Homestead. Uh, Homestead Road, from the measurements we've taken, is anywhere from 17 to 22 foot wide up and down that street. And that spot checking, we didn't measure the exact whole road, but that's the measurements we could find. There are ditches on both sides. You can't get around and pass. Um, if a fire truck was to come down the road and there was another car parked on the street, the fire truck couldn't get by. I remember a few years ago, a fire truck came. There was an old uh, abandoned house on our street. Caught fire. Fire truck came, put out the fire, blocked the road for about four hours. None of the employees on the road could leave till the fire truck put fire out and, so they could get out and home at the end of the day. So this is a very narrow street. I think if you're going to do a development like this, it has to be wide and you have to have sidewalks. You have to have a second entrance. I, I, I'm not for the second entrance. Not for the second entrance. That's not my bailiwick, uh, but I think you have to have a second entrance to that dead-end street to bring in 50 more residential units on that quarter-mile stretch of road. Um, that's really about all I had. Thank you. I, I, I love my neighborhood, love my neighbors, but I, I just think this is a, there's, there needs to be a lot of infrastructure in place before we, we move to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Others speaking in opposition? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Gerald Norton. Whoops. <laughs> My name is Gerald Norton. I live in Oak Park, which is adjacent to Homestead. And I'm not in opposition to the developers and what they plan to do. I know in order to have progress in any municipality or anywhere else, there's going to be growth. And growth, of course, there comes pain with growth. But the pain that we don't want to see is Larkspur opened up to through traffic because now there are children that play in the street. There are people that walk the neighborhood. This would not be a safe area for any of us to live in. So what I'm asking is that you do give consideration to the developers and, you know, their plans. They, they sound pretty good. But we're asking you not to dump all of that traffic into our neighborhood. I don't think it's fair. And from what I've heard here tonight, I've sat here for a long time, you go out of your way to be fair with people. You look at things that I think are really anal, so to speak. But they're necessary. And I'm asking you, when you look at our neighborhood, my neighbors, look at my family and my friends and their families, consider what all this traffic is going to be like coming through our neighborhood. I just don't want the traffic, but we do want the development. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else speaking in opposition? Yes. Good evening. Um, Good evening. My name is Lawrence Tyner, um, and um, I appreciate you having me here today. Um, I also live in the Oak Park area, and um, if you can look at this, the, the map there, it's about a, 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 a 
four block area um, is Oak Ridge to the east, um, Oak Valley to the south, South Ridge to the north, and Locksburg to the west. And this is, is a jewel of a community. I know that the, the, the fast-talking attorney said there was no development in that area. <laughs> but I want to tell you, these are homes that were a brick were built in the 70s. They're well built and well maintained. Most of the people there are middle class people, some of them middle aged and some of them elderly. I've been living there for about 30 years and I, I love the area. If any of you have an opportunity to drive it through that area, please do, because you will be impressed with how it's kept. The lawns are immaculate, everybody's house is painted, and, um, and we, we like living there. The point is that if you make this through road, you will destroy our neighborhood. What you will do is invite <clears throat> traffic that will come through and we will be, become marks for thieves and burglars because most of the people don't have the physicality to resist all of that. And also, um, right now, we have some through roads that come through there, and the, the young people drag race through there. And we have, like he said, kids walking through the streets, uh, people walking, uh, riding their bikes, walking their dogs. And if you let this road come through, as I said, you will destroy our community. And if you take a moment of your time to drive through that community, you will see what I'm talking about. It's a jewel of an area in Nashville, and we do not want it to be destroyed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you give me your address? I got your name. My address is 141 Oak Park Drive. Great. Thank and you so much. I, don't, I didn't build a new house to develop it, but I did spend a lot of money making it livable and making it nice. Okay. And all of the houses over there are very nice. Okay. And, and, and don't let the criminal element come through our community, okay. please. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else speaking in opposition? If not, we do council. Okay. Just please go to McDonald's and uh, get something to eat <laughs> and you'll get a good taste. Okay. Okay. So with that, um, I will, does the applicant want to come back and use your two minutes of rebuttal? And then we'll call the council lady up after. Okay, your choice. Um, the opposition kind of makes the point very well, I think. They don't want to connect a road. This road is inadequate. There's a need for, for wider road. There's a need for probably better circulation at the cul-de-sac. There's a need to maintain stormwater improvements that are already in place and maybe even improve upon those. Our project can do its part toward all of those goals and has agreed to do so. We will pave out more. We will assist with widening the cul-de-sac. We will maintain and even improve stormwater as required under the current law, which is way more stringent than the laws that are in place when most of this street was developed out many years ago. We don't have the ability to do all of it. We don't have the legal ability to pave the entire street and take right of way on either side to widen it. We don't have the ability, as previously discussed, to some considerable length by yours truly, to take the 310 property and connect Larkspur, even if for some reason everybody wanted it, which we're pretty close to 100%. I think that nobody wants that. Um, and if possible, we want to avoid that at all costs. We can only do what we can do, is what I'm telling you. And we'll do it, absolutely, gladly. And we want to be participants. And it may be because, like, I think it was Mr. Kirby that said, I've been here many years. And, and, and Clark, you said also, I've been here many years. And we need these improvements. They're probably willing to do their part, too. But they're not the ones here making an ass. So it's not fair to suggest that somehow they should be doing something. We should, and we will if given the chance. If for some reason at the end of your deliberation tonight, you still feel like there's unanswered questions, you feel like that after hearing from the council member, there's more information specifically that you think would benefit you in considering this, again, unique situation since it is technically recommended for disapproval, we're more than happy to take a one meeting deferral, get you more information, engage, I don't know whom else at this point, but other neighbors or other council members or somebody else continuing our work with council member Toombs to try to satisfy the board with as much information as possible. We'd hate to see it die here tonight. We hope for another shot if that's absolutely necessary. Nevertheless, we ask your support. Will you pay for the traffic light? If they tell me to. Gotta have traffic light. Tell the engineers. Good evening, commissioners. 
Um, there, I held a community meeting for this uh, project along with the um, 330 and 332 Homestead, and most of the property owners on Homestead Road were supportive of development. Most of them are also interested in developing at some point. Uh, the sticking point is the connection to Locksborough Road, uh, which no one in Oak Park subdivision supports. I've forwarded a petition to you all and to staff with about 100 signatures, and I think that's pretty much the entire neighborhood uh, that is opposed to any type of connection to Locksborough Road. So any development that included connection to Locksborough Road, I couldn't support as the council member. And so that that puts people who are current property owners in a, in a tight spot because they're not gonna be able to develop their property and get my approval. Um, because with that type of opposition, I can't support connection to Locksburg. Um, I agree uh, with the potential of, a, of one meeting deferral. I know uh, planning staff has reached out to me to try to set up a meeting in the next couple of weeks to talk about that Dickinson North Corridor plan. Because uh, once again, you have a plan that looks great on paper, but then reality hits and there's an actual project and neighbors see that something's happening that they didn't want to happen. And some of the Oak Park residents did participate in those meetings for the Dickinson North uh, Corridor study. And there was not an understanding that there would be a connection to Locksburg Road. Otherwise, they would have raised that concern then. Um, I think that's all my concerns. Uh, you know, the all I believe all the parcels on, on Homestead are commercial, so folks could develop commercial properties if, if that's what they wanted to do. But as long as that connection is there and it's required as part of any development, no one on that road will be able to move forward because, again, I wouldn't support it as a council person. And you'll have me for four more years because I, I spoke that into existence the last time. So I'm unopposed. So God willing, you'll have me for four more years. <laughs> Thank you, Council Lady. I will declare the public hearing closed. And Councilman Withers, do you want to get us started off? Uh, I would move a deferral. Um, I think that there's a lot of, uh, I'm always pro-housing, uh, and we definitely need to add housing. We are close to Dickerson, which actually does have pretty good transit service and improving all the time. We're adding a lot of dense projects on Dickerson, but there's still a lot of work to be done there. I think the main thing that gives me some degree of pause for this one is the, the, just the condition of the road on Homestead itself. I mean, I definitely get the point that you would want to, anytime you create new connectivity, it creates anxiety, but I'm, I'm usually in favor of those, but maybe not this time. But, but it's the, that condition, the narrowness of the condition on Homestead that does give me some pause. Neither of these projects even taken together would be enough to warrant these projects paying for a traffic signal either. But I, I do really have a lot of concerns about the road uh, condition. I do see a point that with these projects kind of widening and improving things along their front edge, at least provides some stopping spaces where people could maybe pass a little bit, but that is a little bit concerning and it's something where maybe I, I would like to hear more from NDOT about what their recommendations are for that street. So I would be in favor of a, of a deferral to maybe hear a little bit more from NDOT on that. Couple things. One, this is one of the reasons why with the East Bank plan, we tied the right of way acquisition up front with the policy. It's a lesson and it's something we have to do more of in the future. We've done that within another policy area. It is critical, very hard work but it is critical at the time of doing the policy work. The second is um, sometimes we see sites like this. If you can go back, Lisa, to the overview, the sort of gray, black and white, that, that one. If you just look at this development pattern, you can see the enormous challenge of trying to envision how a great um, mobility network could actually be accomplished when you see the disparate patterns of development, even just in this one shot on the right-hand side of the interstate. And so sometimes we will say a development is premature and we will put pressure on a developer 
to basically say, wait until you are able to acquire more property so that we can come up with a more holistic solution. I think it's fair for the applicant to say, we tried and we weren't able to do that. And so it's for the commission to sort of weigh um, sort of the fairness of kind of um, that approach versus, you know, taking a site by site condition. If we do defer, I would just ask the chairwoman to see if there are any other comments we need to take into account during that deferral. I know that uh, right of way, uh, existing right of way improvements, needed future connections is something you're um, asking about. The other thing I would put on the table and I know this wouldn't be welcome to the applicant necessarily, sometimes we'll say, well, the intensity is too much. If we can't get the improvement, then bring the intensity down. Again, that sometimes make a, makes a project not feasible, um, but the policy assumed a connection. And so to review a zoning application that meets the policy where a connection can't be made perhaps requires a different uh, balance. And so anyway, I would only ask, if I'm, perhaps a deferral uh, is where we are, if there are any other comments that would help us to be productive during that uh, deferral time, I would welcome those also. I mean, actually, that was the two, those are two things I was thinking that there's something has to be done down in Homestead. And I mean, reading actually just what you said, or not what you said, but um, that, yeah, what the staff said of a um, it should be improved before, so it's almost like you can't have this density with the way it's set up right now. So, um, I, you know, however that needs to be worked out, I do agree with the deferral maybe to work through that, but less density would be a lot more easy to stomach on Homestead, I think, but um, as it is right now. Mr. Henley? So, I mean, I have a couple of different things, but you know, for me, I've, I've been in the situation before where you've been asked or requested to try to make acquisitions or figure out easements, and it is very challenging to, to a project. Um, I think here, one thing that we heard, and again, the council member shared, is the lack of desire for, con for the connection. And I, I would say, you know, when you look at an aerial, I think it makes a lot of sense. But when you look at the zoning, it really doesn't. I mean, you have a pretty significant corridor, you have all commercial, and then you have a storied neighborhood right a neighborhood that's been there for for generations and so i just don't think the connection is appropriate i mean looking at the map you know it, it i think the, the parcel sizes show you that um and yet again i feel like you know we're in a spot where we're talking about potential housing that we know our city desperately needs and we're likely saying no um, possibly saying no because our public infrastructure just isn't adequate um, and it seems like just the road itself is not up to standards and it's a, com it's a commercially active road. So it, it, to me, it just, it beckons a collaboration, I think from our department and for NDOT to really look at the road itself. It seems like we've got a lot of the property owners that are engaged, which is fantastic. Um, and there might be some type of plan that we can put together. I would love to see a, a something at least in concept that would work for that for that particular road because it seems like we've got a handful of individuals that are kind of controlling that that, that road um, and, and not just say no to to housing i mean i agree density is difficult when you don't have the infrastructure for it but if you can make some some strides to improve the infrastructure i think it's a great opportunity to to put density there i mean we've got an applicant that's proposing you know 60 some odd units um on CS zoning that's clearly underutilized and you know we don't have enough residential zoning that's being utilized to its full potential so I just I really think this is one that could deserve special attention even though the scale of the projects are are smaller than what we may traditionally think of when we look at infrastructure but I, I do think these these are these are warranted um I think Commissioner Hanley made some good points I don't know that that the kind of discussion that He's suggesting can happen in a one meeting deferral. We need two. Um, but also, I mean, I know we look at these separately, but given you've got two projects right next to each other, I mean, I guess the other question is just, is something else needed on, on all of the side of Homestead? I mean, because I, I would imagine once you have two pretty significant um, 
residential things, there will be pressure for what's between there to get rezoned as residential. So is it worth a discussion about, you know, perhaps looking at all of Homestead for a change in use? We'll ask NDOT. Um, NDOT participated in the initial study where we made the recommendation for the connection. And so that they would have provided input there, but I think given the discussion here, we can um, have NDOT, we'll go out and look at the site and give some recommendations, assuming no connection, assuming a connection, what other improvements need to be made and see if we can give that feedback to the commission. Councilman Withers. Uh, thank you, Director Kemp, for providing that background. I mean, I, I think for me, I just kind of wanted, more than anything, want to know kind of what the general plan is for this road um, so that uh, maybe it'd be a little bit on the record for the commission, just as future rezonings come forward, how do they all participate in that in a way that makes sense? But uh, Director Kemp, your uh, indication that uh, NDOT was part of an initial review gives me some hope that like we're not asking them to do something completely from scratch. So I'm wondering if, uh, if given that, and given that we do have a all day weekend coming up, so it'll be a little, a little what, would, a, would we be able to get at least something conceptual within a one meeting deferral rather than a two? We would love that. Unfortunately, we are um, challenged with our staff report schedule. And so staff reports are due on Friday of next week. Well, For junior? Sorry, staff reports are due tomorrow. Staff reports are due tomorrow, but they're public Friday. So because we we have to go through a, a pretty rigorous rigorous review process, and so we need recommendations and, and everything from all of the agencies, and it's a short week, and so we would be publishing the report for June eighth next Friday, and so one meeting deferrals are are just are just really tough um, when you're at, when you're asking us for sort of more information because we've got uh, 45 or 50 projects that we're already tracking for that for that deadline. Okay, so it sounds like a two meeting deferral is where we're leaving, but does anyone want to make a motion or is there further discussion? I make a motion to defer two meetings and with all the things, uh, asked by commissioners to staff to gather all the information uh, stated by the commissioners. Okay, second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Okay, motion carries. Um, is, is the same project the next one? I mean, should, could, could we take the next one on the street? It, just so that we... Lisa, is that out of order or are we, we're out of order? order it? It's the next, okay. it's the next item to be presented. Okay. okay. Um, I guess the question is, it, it's going to be the same. It's, it's a, it is a very similar presentation in that the infrastructure called for in the plan is not in place. Okay. So. I would recommend going ahead with a public hearing and um, the applicant has seen how this has gone. So we'll see okay. what they have to say when they have their comments. Okay. Yeah. Item 21. Item Dustin Shane, staff planner. Item 21 is 330 and 332 Homestead Road. <clears throat> this is a request for a a regulatory SP to permit all uses of MULA zoning except for specifically excluded uses on the plan. <laughs> Our recommendation is disapprove. Zoning on the site, CS Commercial Services, uh, the policy T4 Urban Community Center, and then Dickerson North Plan. It's listed as medium intensity. Here's a look at the uh, regulatory SP document. Uh, it's, the, the applicant is planning a multifamily development on three parcels, uh, about two and a quarter acre, which currently con uh, contains two single family homes. Surrounding uses include single family, uh, vacant land, uh, industry, mostly zone CS, some RS10, and then there's commercial zone CS, two parcels to the east. Uh, the small area plan, as we, we saw, uh, envisions this area as transitional from single family to commercial. 
Um, it's listed as medium intensity. And the base policy is T4 Community Center, um, which envisions a pretty intense level of development, mixed use, supporting the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and MULA is listed as appropriate. However, as we've, as we've talked uh, extensively about, we need more infrastructure here per that small area plan, that extension of Larkspur, um, and then also Homestead's uh, present condition, which here's a screenshot showing a uh, 20 foot pavement and uh, no, no curb, no gutter, no sidewalks. So our recommendation is uh, disapproval. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Applicant here. Hi, John like Michael, here. Thompson Burton Law Firm. On behalf of the, uh, it's the West who own this property, but we're trying to work with them right now in terms of uh, the development project for the same client, Mr. Miyabel, I, you've heard from earlier. I would ask, at least for the benefit of the record, to acknowledge prior arguments with regard to the same road and policy area issues from the prior cases to be acknowledged here. And with that, I saved us seven minutes. Um, I would note that a two-meeting deferral is functionally a 16-week deferral in that our ability to go through the zoning process and get to council buys a lot of time. Um, it, you know, obviously for clients, if it gets them there and that's what it absolutely requires and that's what it does. So to whatever extent we could maybe consider just merely adopting the existing report from staff rather than making them go through the arduous process of creating a new one and then gave us the homework, meaning the applicants, the homework of securing as much information as possible from NDOT with regard to possible opportunities for expansions of the roadway, uh, beg on our hands and knees for permission to put in a, a traffic light that they'll never give us permission to do at that location, whatever the case may be we're willing to go do the homework and provide the information with the understanding that having sat in a not dissimilar seat from what miss milligan described i still remember the year we did 728 bza cases in the year of our lord 2017 and i remember presenting all 724 of them and that stunk so i know what it's like to have too many reports to get ready on a really big agenda and i've got things on june 8 as well so i understand we're happy to step in and do what we can to meet the need, if that would be worthy of the board's consider or the commission's consideration today. Um, the same arguments apply. The only modification here is with the, to the extent that there is skepticism about the Larkspur connection on the first case, I think you can double down on that here because 330 and 332 are hundreds of feet further east toward Dickerson and even more directly connected to Dickerson, less directly connected to where that Larkspur connection would theoretically be. So there's even less correlation between this project and the Larkspur connection than the first one, which I thought was close to zero to begin with. So I would ask the board or the commission to consider that, please. And um, I suppose I'll save my almost eight minutes for a rebuttal that's almost definitely not going to happen. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Anyone wanting to speak in support? Okay. We still Again, need. My name is Joan West, and I live on Homestead Road. And what I forgot to tell you guys before is that there are homes on Homestead Road, and we have been good neighbors with the commercial part. So um, we would hope that those people that are businesses would still be good neighbors to the new development. Um, it's a great location. It's right there at 65. There's Skyline Hospital. There's all kinds of places to eat. So I think it's a great place to raise a family. I think I did pretty good being raised there. So um, we appreciate your time and um, think that it would be good for the neighborhood as long as you don't put the connecting in. And not that um, just because... Um, people from Oak Park would be coming in Homestead Road to go to McDonald's or to have another thoroughfare to Dickerson Road. So, um, like we said, don't do the connecting for the development. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else speaking in support? Okay. If not, anyone speaking in opposition? Yes. Well, I'm all fine for development. I uh, guess there's uh, homes that have been there forever. If you want to come build a single family, 4,000 square foot home, 
that's great, but all of a sudden you start putting 150 people in there trying to get out. And I'm telling you, if you don't put a traffic light up there, this is a dead deal. Now, the good news about not putting a traffic light in is the fire department's only a half a mile away. So hopefully nobody will die in a traffic wreck. Thank you. Uh, sir, I need your name and address one more time. What's that? We need your name and address oh, for the I'm record. I'm uh, Clark Crawford. I'm at 319 Homestead Road. My wife and I bought a building there 20 years ago, and we run an auto repair shop. Great. Thank you so much. I was so much. born and raised here, and I'm about sick and tired of the progress in this town. Thank you. All right. Anyone else speaking in opposition? Steve Kirby, Homestead Road owner. I'm next door to Clark, who wants a red light, just so you understand, in case you missed it. Um, again, I, I've been on the road for years. It won't be the same road if the West move out. Um, all of our neighbors, we've taken care of, watched over each other on our kind of sleepy little street. Uh, but if you'll note, the only people for this are the people selling to the developer and the developer. Everyone else is not. Um, that's great. I'm not against the West making money. I'm not against Bell Development making money. I'm not anti-development. But I think that kind of density is going to wreck our street as small as it is without all the improvements we've talked about. Um, I heard you, what somebody said, that if we don't allow residential development, that the development on Homestead was going to die. That is not true. I know of uh, real estate groups now that are trying to acquire property on Homestead Road, and I myself would like to acquire more property on Homestead Road so I can build a bigger office. We've outgrown our space. I need more parking. I need more space. I need a bigger office. I would love to develop that on Homestead Road. So that development commercially is not dead. And that's, again, why I love that street, because of the commercial zoning on it, that the street went commercial zoning, I think, probably, I don't know, 20 years ago. Um, Again, love all the neighbors and have loved the uh, history of the street. We just want to keep it kind of uh, <laughs> not 200 cars running down the street every day crashing into McDonald's. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else speaking in opposition? If not, uh, would the applicant like to use your two minutes for a rebuttal? The rebuttal is not a rebuttal per se, but an agreement that the improvements are needed. We're willing to do our part. It sounds like other folks are probably willing to do their part, too. Uh, we can't force them to. They're not here looking for a rezoning. We understand that. But uh, if the board needs more information, we're happy to do the legwork of getting a refreshed view from NDOT and others with regard to some of the ideas that have been discussed here tonight that hadn't been fleshed out more fully in the past. And obviously continue to work with Councilmember Toombs, uh, despite being a pleasure, will also be an important part of what we need to do going forward. So we would humbly ask for your support for this zoning bill. And in the absence of your support, a one meeting deferral so we can still finish this session. Thanks. Thank you. With that, I will declare the public hearing closed and Commissioner Henley, you want to start us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, I think. Sorry, we need to close the public hearing. No, I did. Oh, you did close the public hearing. Okay. Yeah. So I think, you know, the, the basis of my comments are, again, they're still aligned with the comments that we had on the past case, but, um, the traffic, I mean, here we have a clear recommendation from, from NDOT, and, and so I think the app can make the, uh, I would say, commitment to work with NDOT. I don't, I don't know how we as a body and staff feel about that time frame of being able to deliver that. I think really right now, I think deferral's been put on the table. The council member herself mentioned deferral. Mm -hmm. Right now we're talking about one meeting versus versus two meetings. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, do we feel like that's a sufficient request we, or do we think that we just, we as a, as a governing body, we think we need the two meetings? Well, we just approved the two meeting deferral for the last case. I understand. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it like this. If it's me and I've got two chances and you already told me no to one, I still want to hear about the second chance. So the reviewing comments from the other departments, I understand, are due tomorrow to Lisa for the next agenda. So we will have gone to bed and gotten up and asked for NDOT to review comments from this body and get feedback in 
a matter of several hours. And then we publish the staff report next Friday for that week. And so it's, it's, I, I think if we're going to give you meaningful feedback from NDOT, which is what I think we're asking for, um, it needs to be a two meeting deferral. I guess I could ask Lisa one more time, tell us, does this, does a two meeting deferral bump this applicant from this council term? No, with an asterisk. Um, so um, projects that are heard on the agenda tonight and on June 8th, if recommended for approval, have their bills automatically filed at the end of June for an introduction and first reading in July, public hearing in August and second reading, and then third reading on August 13th, which is the last meeting of this term. Um, if um, the items that are heard on the June 22nd would only be filed if the council member requests early that we file the bill the day after that hearing. That is not unheard of when we sort of get to this point in a term. And so the council member could request, put in a request with us to say, I want you to file this bill on the 23rd of June, um, which would then follow that same schedule, July introduction, August public hearing. So that's the asterisk is that we just have to be asked. Councilman Withers. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you, Lisa, for that reminder, because even I can't keep up the very ever shortening calendar. Um, and keep it all uh, clear in my mind sometimes, but um, uh, I understand the applicant's desire to have a, a one meeting to for all maximum because it provides a little bit of an easier path to get uh, this before the council for the public hearing in August. I would um, caution the applicant and um, and just remind all of us that if the council member, it would require perhaps an additional step for the council member to request the bill early, maybe. But if the council member does not feel comfortable with the, the application in any event, uh, she, she may or may not pass it. And so since there are concerns that, that have been shared even by the council member, um, I, I think it is best to work through the process to get the department of reviews in place uh, to make sure everyone's comfortable um, and as otherwise, uh, it, if, if some of the concerns that were raised have not been addressed, the council member may or may not um, decide to move the bill at all. Any other comments on this? All right, well then anyone who would like to make a motion? Just one quick comment. Okay. I think it was uh, clear at the last uh, same uh, street, uh, so from the end that uh, specifically you would like to hear feasibility of abandoning uh, that portion of connector. Not only because right now report is based on connector need to be created, but you know, what is the feasibility to abandoning? So that I just wanna, wanna specify. With that, I would like to uh, make a motion to defer two meetings. Okay. Um. And are we keeping the public hearing open or close? Close, close it. Uh, um. Do you want further discussion on that? Okay. Uh, all, all in favor? Okay. Motion carries for a two meeting deferral. Um, okay. We are on to item 27. Thank you. 
Are we ready? Okay. This is item 27. The request is rezoned three properties outlined in red to industrial. Properties are located on the north side of Ashland City Highway. Braille Parkway is just to the west of the properties. Together, the three properties contain approximately 27 acres. Staff recommends disapproval. The existing zoning is agricultural and residential and single family residential. Approximately 12 acres is zoned agricultural and residential and could permit up to seven residential units. The remaining approximately 15 acres is zoned single family and permit up to 45 single family lots. This is in the Bordeaux White Creek Haynes Training to Community Plan. The policies are conservation and rural maintenance. Conservation is intended to preserve some steep slopes and streams on the site. Rural maintenance policy is intended to maintain rural character, whereas applied typical uses include agricultural and residential. Staff finds the proposed IR zoning district is not consistent with the land use policies. Portion of the site are located within conservation policy, recognizes areas of steep slopes and streams with associated buffers that bisects the property. Most of the properties are within T2 RM policy, which only supports residential uses and are rural in character. The proposed IR zoning district permits non-residential uses, including industrial and manufacturing uses that are incompatible with the goals of the applied policy. Given the inconsistencies with policy, staff recommends disapproval. Open up the public hearing. Is the applicant here? You'll have 10 minutes and you can hold back two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for your time this afternoon, this evening. Um, I'll try to stick to my script for the interest of time. I've got a few exhibits that are coming around that I'll reference in just a moment. So um, as, we, as we are here tonight, I wanted to provide a little bit of context for why we're bringing this rezoning before you. Um, in the wake of the March 2020 tornado, my client's warehouse on Cockrell Bend was devastated uh, in that event. They found temporary refuge in a subleased space in Laverne, but have since been seek seeking a suitable location to move their operations back to Nashville. I'll pause and make sure, just for a second, make sure everybody's got this going around. Uh, my client identified and purchased the property on Ashton City Highway, which is currently zoned industrial restrictive IR already at the corner there as well as unnumbered properties on Cato Road in July of 2022. During the planning stage, we recognized the, the only potential for warehouse exit traffic was on Cato Road to the north of the site, a concern to us and the local community as, it, as that access would bring traffic out to the residential communities. So we aimed to find a solution that would respect community interest while allowing for the continued an efficient operation of a future warehouse. Ever since identifying the property in 2021, my client has engaged in a constructive dialogue with the Church of the Living God, the owners of 4520 Ashland City Highway. Considering the contrast between my client's intent for warehouse distribution and the church's religious activities, extensive discussions have been held to explore collaborative solutions that would mutually, mutually benefit both parties. And we're confident the proposal we're bringing before you today successfully embodies many of those shared objectives. I do wanna point out that um, in, in engaging the community, we did have a difficult time engaging the, uh, the current council member. Uh, there were a few phone calls, but uh, we were not able to have a meeting. We did reach out and connect to three of the district one uh, candidates for council and uh, had, had a meeting with them where they were supportive of the project and they actually helped us set up a community meeting with members of the community, which we held on May 18th at the Northwest YMCA. About 50 people were in attendance at that. And we have another meeting set up for June 8th at the Bordeaux Library. So today we present a proposal that's designed to restrict the warehouse distribution operations to Ashland City Highway without any access to Cato Road. And this is what we presented to the community members on May 18th. And we believe it balances our operational needs with the community interests. We do acknowledge and the rationale behind staff's recommendation of disapproval. The prevailing policy is rural, rural maintenance. 
when we broached the idea of revisiting the community plan, we didn't find much support with staff for doing that. Um, in line with this policy, staff finds itself in a position to suggest disapproval as, as, as before you, as our proposal requests a rezone to IR. And we appreciate and, and understand that stance. However, we believe that this case necessitates a broader perspective on the project. The property at the junction of Ashland City Highway and Briley is currently zoned as IR, allowing for immediate industrial development. Given the proximity of the site's boundary on Ashland City Highway to Briley, my client could be compelled in theory to, access, to use Cato Road as an access point, which we believe would not be in the best interest of the neighborhood. If you'll look at this exhibit here that has just been handed out, uh, this shows what could be developed by right today at that corner. The entrance to Ashton City Highway at the bottom of the page would be right in, right out only because of a divided median there at Ashland City. So the traffic to that warehouse distribution would have to extend north uh, through, the proper, through the properties there to Cato Road, which we don't believe would be in the best interest of the neighborhood to the north. So I just wanted you to see what could be done today. However, with the proposal that we're talking about tonight with the rezone and working with the church, something like this here on this, this color plan where the uh, more industrial warehouse use could occur to the south, moving the entrance to Ashland City Highway to the west, getting past that divided median, and would completely restrict truck traffic to Ashland City Highway and thereby allowing for the church, uh, future church uses on the north half of the property that would access Cato Road. So we've worked together extensively to come up with this plan. So we've worked together to come up with a solution that aligns with as many common goals as possible. And we respectfully suggest that this proposal, while requiring a departure from the current policy, offers a more balanced, balanced and community-minded approach to the, to the utilization of the site. So with that, I will reserve time for rebuttal and I thank you for uh, considering our request tonight. Thanks. You know, I realized we did not get your name and address to start. Travis Todd with Thomas and Hutton Engineering at 615 Main Street. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Sir? Anyone speaking in support? Yes. Good evening, Chip Howarth, Adapt Development, 7337 Cockrell Bend Boulevard. Um, Travis did a great job summarizing the request. I, again, our position is uh, when, when taking zoomed out, when evaluating what's not on the screen, talking with the Cato Road community, when we had our meeting on May 18th, the overwhelming response was, thank goodness you're trying to do something that doesn't put more traffic, especially industrial traffic, on Cato Road. Our um, use, you know, we have kind of a broad definition of industrial underneath the code, um, and people confuse it a lot of times with manufacturing. No, that's not what this is, this is warehouse distribution. Um, and it's a pretty light lift in terms of trucks coming in and out. Nonetheless, what we're proposing to do is essentially a land swap with the church, giving them ownership of property on Cato Road, um, to which they're, and you're gonna hear a little bit about that in a minute, about what they propose to do. And that, all the industrial ends up on Ashland City Highway. Um, the addition of the other parcel allows us to move access farther away from Briley to keep all the ingress egress on Ashland City Highway. Um, a little bit more about the community involvement. Um, as Travis stated, had a little bit of trouble finding the appropriate form for a meeting. Um, was put in touch with Gary Moore, who I'm sure this body knows a little bit. Gary uh, set up a meeting for us and multiple uh, District 1 candidates who we used to distribute uh, notification of a neighborhood meeting on May 18th at the Northwest YMCA, which was pretty well attended. Uh, again, the feedback generally was, we're really glad we're not looking to put any type of traffic on Cato Road. Um, and the church use, again, like you said, you'll hear about it in a minute. So uh, on another note, she had to go. Um, it's been a long night, but Councilmember Toombs was also at the meeting at the Northwest Y, though not her district. The church currently owns property in District 2, um, and some of the constituents of the church are also District 2 members, so Councilmember Toombs has taken an interest in this as well. Um, so we respectfully request uh, that you approve this, and thank you so much for your time and what you do for Nashville. Thank you. Others speaking in support? We'll have two minutes, and start with your name and address. All right. My name is Aaron Lockhart. I'm at 3808 Clarksville Pike here in Nashville, Tennessee. I am a representative, a registered agent for the Church of the Living God, the Pillar of the Ground of the Truth. We have been in this community uh, actively since 1908. 
our mandate says that it requires that we have, have a national headquarters meeting in the city of Nashville. And we have done that. And in the 1930s, we've had representation that brought in uh, Avon Williams as well as the uh, Alexander Luby uh, with this body. That was the last time we were before a commission. So I appreciate your time to hear this out. Of all the individuals who are affected by this particular uh, request, it would be our church. And for us, we have engaged and listened to them over a period of about two years before we finally came to the understanding that this is a good move for the community. We have been in receipt of the property since 1982, and we have had the intention to build our national headquarters here in Nashville. We hold annual meetings uh, once a year, third week of July, and we have done so since the 1930s. And uh, most of our folks come in and we uh, saturate local hotels and we utilize those areas for meeting because we don't have a main facility. But our hope and intent is that we build a headquarters facility here at this property and the land swap allows us to do that. And it is in, within harmony of the community. Uh, we own property in the Eaton's Creek area as well. So we have been here and we hope that you seriously consider what we have done. And that is to find this as a good move for the rezoning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Others speaking in support? Yes. Hello, Ryan Moses, um, 7337 Cockrell Bend Boulevard. Um, I am the business owner of Best Brands. We're um, planning to relocate to this location as um, Tom Sutton pointed out, we um, lost our warehouse during the tornado and have had to actually have a facility in Laverne. We have been in this community, in the Nashville community for four generations with best brands. Um, my family in itself is five generations within the Nashville area. We have full intention of making this a family owned and operated business and we have people here supporting in the same capacity. We are producing high paying jobs within this neighborhood and we've actively had employees from this neighborhood and surrounding neighborhoods for since the repeal of prohibition. We're looking for something that's the best for this community. Right now, we are put in a position where we have a warehouse facility that we could build that would then push truck traffic out to a residential road. We want nothing to do with that. We want to be able to push traffic to Broadly Parkway and to the industrial corridor. I think this provides an opportunity to do both fulfill our needs and then also give the church something that they wouldn't be able to do without us. This isn't something that we take lightly. We've been working in partnership with them for many years now, as they told you, in this capacity. So what I would just tell you is, while I understand kind of where the overlay is and, and what, what this means in terms of a policy, I think this is a unique situation and that there is a contiguous parcel that is already zoned IR, which we can build a warehouse. This gives us the ability to build a bigger warehouse and buy a warehouse. This isn't some this will be, I think the other piece I will want to say as well is because of the topography around it, it will actually be contained to that area so the community behind won't even see this warehouse from a uh, height restriction piece and those sort of things as well. So I just want to um, kind of speak on our behalf and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Others speaking in support. Hello, John Michael, Thompson Burton Law Firm, 1801 West End Avenue. We will ask for a vote tonight. We think it's important to go ahead and take a vote on this zoning bill. Uh, we understand that some may think there's more deliberation that's needed. However, with the great engagement that our group has had, both with the community meeting and with other neighborhood stakeholders and leaders, um, we think we've got the project worked up in a way, especially with the concessions and the commitments that have been made by other people here tonight to demonstrate what we're doing by way of traffic. That's very important and it's worthy of a vote tonight. And we humbly so ask for your support for the rezoning bill as contemplated. Um, I think it bears in mind one one last thing, and Mr. Holworth correctly made the identification that under the Metro Zoning Code, there are the three different zoning districts for industrial uses. Uh, with, with this being a warehouse use, this is not a factory where some noxious fumes are emitted or horrible sound is made by huge clanging uh, pieces of equipment. It's a warehouse. Box trucks deliver drinks in and out, uh, go off to the places where they have clients. Um, that's the beginning and end of it. Ultimately, the ongoing engagement is the reason we're ready to go ahead and see a vote tonight. Because as was mentioned, we have a June 8 meeting, community meeting lined up yet again with all of the interested folks, the local candidates or council. We will continue to invite the uh, current council member and other council members as well. And we think that we've got this worked up in a way where we can proceed from tonight, hopefully with your recommendation of approval, and then continue through the council process. Um, thank you for your consideration of this bill. 
Thank you. Are you sp others speaking in support? I'd like to say good evening to everybody. Uh, my name is Chuck Gleaves. I've been a part of this company for since 2013. I've been very loyal. Um, this is my second family. Um, so I do understand the concerns that may arise about the traffic in the city uh, within that area. Um, morning departures are very early in the morning to where we wouldn't have no issues with traffic, um, as well as the um, the afternoon rivals back to the warehouse. Um, I think it's a very good thing, man. And I really hope that you guys really see us through. Thank you. Thank you. They're speaking in support. You give us your name and address. Two minutes. My name is Lauren Moore, 132 Ivy Hill Lane in Goodlesville. And uh, as an employee of Best Brands since 2015 and a resident of this community, I can comfortably, con I can comfortably say, assure you that Best Brands would never purpose, propose, or execute a plan that disrupts the lives of our community's residents. We are aware of the uh, congestion concerns on Cato Road and have no intention of worsening the traffic situation there. I strongly urge you to consider who we are as a company, the positive contributions we have made to the greater Nashville community, and the potential benefits we can bring to the area and its residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Alan Shaw, 3514 Chesapeake Drive. I've been a part of this community for over 30 plus years. Since joining Best Brands uh, and doing the work that we do, I've been with this company since 2016. This company has consist consistently provided valuable resources for me and my family as residents of the area. I have been very heartfelt with the work and the workplace of it being a close, being in a close area. As a driver uh, covering the Middle Tennessee area, I am often traveling to various locations, which means I am not consistently present in the area of the warehouse. We have more than just a fleet of vehicles on the roads. We are a team driven by our core values within the community. So as you deliberate in the matter, I kindly urge you tonight to consider the commitment and excellence of a deep-rooted connection to the community. Best Brands is an embodiment of values, aspirations, as we make up this community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Shay Flowers. My address is 1813 Bell Arbor Drive. <laughs> Wonderful. With over 25 years of experience in the industry, my journey began with Best Brands in 2006. While my primary role is in the office in AR, accounts receivable, I also work closely with our de dedicated delivery drivers. As a longstanding member of this community, I take immense pride in being part of the Best Brands family. I wholeheartedly believe that our presence here would bring significant benefits to local businesses and families alike. As an active member of this community, I can personally attest to the fact that our employees genuinely enjoy patronizing local restaurants and establishments, despite the state-of-the-art break room we have in our office. By, best brands having, by having best brands in your backyard, the revenue generated would have a direct and positive impact on the local economy. Our employees who are deeply connected to this community would rather contribute, contribute to the growth and prosperity of the area. I am honored to be an intricate part of a company that values company, community engagement, and understands the importance of supporting local businesses. 
one that not only enhances the livelihoods of our employees, but also brings prosperity to the community we call home. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> uh, my name is Harrison Buck. Uh, my wife and I own a home in the nations, 4905 Kentucky Avenue. Um, as a lifelong native and resident of Nashville, my love for this town runs deep. I've worked for Best Brands for many years. I think it's about eight years now. Uh, and I know firsthand how much they contribute and cherish this community. Our intention is not to be just another faceless corporation imposing itself in the area. Rather, we seek to work hand in hand with the community embracing its spirits and values. In my role as a sales manager, I oversee a team of, of dedicated representatives who are actively engaged in the market, supporting our customers and partners. We are doers and our goal is to actively contribute to the community. We want to be an integral part of this community, sharing in its joys and challenges and making a positive impact along the way. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. My name is Kim Davis. I'm at 9064 Old Charlotte Pike in Pegram. Um, Best Brands holds a remarkable place in our community's history, and I've had the privilege of being part of this company for nearly a decade. I have personally witnessed their steady commitment to their employees. Prior to the tornado that struck our building in March 2020, we operated as a unified entity with our house, office, and warehouse all under the same roof. This setup allowed us, allowed us to shine, working seamlessly together to deliver exceptional products and customer service. Returning to a single location with this property as our future office and warehouse space would reunite our team and rejuvenate, rejuvenate our collective spirits. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Hola, hi, good evening. My name is Jessica Llanos. I work at Best Brands and I, I'm a member of the community. What's the heart of Ashland City? It's family like ours, family who have been part of this community for generations. We are not outsider. We grew up here, we played in the parks, we attended these schools. We are woven into the fabric of Ashland City and surrounding cities, just like you. We want our business to reflect this love, this sense, this belonging, and to contribute positively to our hometown. We invite you to stand with us to support our growth as we commit of fostering a prosperous, harmonious, and sustainable future for the place we all call home. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Can uh, we need your address? We got your name. Okay. Um, my name is Jessica Llanos, uh -huh. and my address is thirty six thirty four Broadway Pike, Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Hello. Good evening. Here. My name is Danielle Mendelson. I'm at sixteen seventy seven fifty fourth Avenue North, apartment one two five. I just moved. Um, for nearly 10 years, I've been part of a family-owned business dating back four generations in Nashville. More than gaining a profit, we've aimed to service our community through consistent customer service and dedicated support and volunteerism. When a, when a tornado tore through our office and warehouse in March 2020, we exhibited resilience, shifting our warehouse operations to Laverne and our office work to Berry Hill, all without compromising our service or our employees' livelihoods. Yet our hearts stayed rooted in the community we've called home for so long. Looking ahead, we yearn to return to our original side of town and join our office and warehouse teams again. By approving our plan, we bring our family back together. And by opening back on our original side of town, we aim to create more local employment opportunities and reinforce a sense of community. As our Director of Human Resources, I know personally about our competitive wages, our comprehensive health care benefits, and our focus on financial security. We hope to be able to bring jobs and this commitment not just to our current employees, but to the people in this community. Our mission is the well-being of our workforce. We believe that by returning to this original location, we can revive our community spirit while facilitating personal and professional growth for our team. 
Together, we can build a brighter future for our employees in the community we proudly serve. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Hi, my name is Levi Shoy. I am at 5038 Old Hides Ferry Pike. Um, I live less than a mile from this location. Uh, and as one of the employees of Best Brands, this would by far impact me <laughs> one, of the, by, you know, one, one of the most heavily because it would make it right down the road from me. This also impacts my community directly because I live right here. Uh, those of us who live on this street and know this neighborhood uh, know that this is something that would both be good for our community. It would give us the ability to be closer not only to our work, but bring more jobs to this community. Uh, a place that has a lot of good, hardworking people that need more opportunity. Uh, I have had the privilege to serve as the Associate Director of Operations for Best Brands for uh, a few years now. And after we went through the tornado and our facility got as uh, destroyed as it did, I was one of the people who was intimately involved in the restoration and recreation of our offices and where we are. I have a personal uh, strong concern for the environment and how we place ourselves in it. I want to make sure that as we move forward and as we rebuilt during the tornado that we were concerned with native plants and how our landscaping is impacted there. We already are located at an area that is prone to flooding uh, right next to the Cumberland River. We have a whole lot of familiarity with drainage and how we need to appropriate our space for those sorts of egresses. Uh, we absolutely want to make sure that this continues to be our concern as we move forward in this space. The environment and how we present ourselves there is going to be paramount to my position and how we move forward here. Uh, I wanted to make sure that you all know that we are concerned with our environmental impact and how we both present ourselves to the community and to our environment. Uh, thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. Anyone else in speaking in support? If not, anyone speaking in opposition? Yes, please come forward. Do you guys want to line up and good evening. My name is Troy Williams. I live at 4479 Cato Road, which is just one parcel separated from this property. I didn't know anything about the uh, meeting that they had on May 18th. First, I'd heard about that tonight. Um, they keep talking about a land swap, but that's not what their request is all about. They're requesting the change to uh, zoning for a property that would exit out onto Cato Road. This is the second time that a request of this nature has come before this commission. Different property owner at this time. It was previously disapproved. Hope you'll disapprove it once again. They can do their land swap and it won't be a big issue at all. But right now it is an issue because they're asking for that property to be rezoned from AR2A to IR. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, I'm Ian Rett, uh, 4600 Cato Road. I requested five minutes as a neighborhood organization. I'll take six, It'd be great. No, thanks. Uh, thanks everybody. Uh, um, I feel like I just got blitzed. Um, and I really hope that the best brands gives all these employees a nice bonus for coming out and saying nice things about their company. And if we were here to make a decision about whether or not best brands is a good company, I would say, go for it, vote for it. They're a great company, but that's not why we're here. We're here to talk about this zoning issue, which is a real problem. And I really like that they want to talk about a broader context. And, and so let's zoom out for a second. We just heard about this pro this project six days ago. We had a community meeting that was hastily assembled. We had 30 or 40 people who were not glad to know that there was no commercial traffic going to be on Cato Road. Everyone was sort of shocked that this was happening. I think the characterization that it was, oh, we're fine with it just because there's no there's no commercial traffic is, is misinterpreting uh, what, what the reaction was, which is, as you know, District 1 has zero tolerance for any kind of industrial expansion right now. So the idea that, that it's just okay that, that it expands is not in alignment with what's so in the, in the community right now. Um, it's been 556 days since we've had a council person stand in front of us and lead a conversation as a community. There's a rush right now to get this project through in order to meet the calendar so that they can move forward their development. In the meantime, the context is District 1 is broken. We do not have a representative and we're in the midst of an, of, of a, of a, of an election. There were four council, um, uh, uh, four council, uh, um, candidates. Thank you. Uh, who showed up. We had a uh, council member Toombs from district two, but Jonathan Hall did not appear. And so now 
what will happen is if it's approved or disapproved, it's still gonna go to council. And, and this is a really interesting situation because they have IR by right on the corner there. And what they wanna do is expand that larger space. But we know that in the district one says no industrial expansion. So there's gotta be a conversation that happens about this. Um, the idea of 18 wheelers turning onto uh, Cato Road and by which they, they say by right, if you don't uh, agree with this plan, what we're gonna do is come up to Cato Road and bring 18 wheelers and box trucks and turn right directly onto an overpass. If you recall, you've gone up there, if you come around right over that overpass where you can see where that slide, that access they propose for commercial traffic is, is like 10 feet from the overpass. Imagine an 18 wheeler making a right turn onto an overpass. Is that gonna be feasible? I don't think so. They have a, a, a median strip at the bottom which prevents the left turn access to get back onto Briley. So they're gonna have to turn right if they go by right um, down there. The point of this is that's a very kind of confusing situation that deserves more conversation. This needs an SP that needs to be sure that that industrial uh, property never becomes chem chemical storage, which they could put 90,000 gallons of chemical storage on there. Another owner could by right using the IR zoning. We wanna make sure that that doesn't happen. So the request that I have is an indefinite deferral. I would like the, the, the commission to consider just kicking this out until district one has had an election, has elected a representative, and that there's an appropriate process to go through in order to arrive at a solution to this, this really interesting situation where you have IR by right, which is a legacy zoning. It was zoned in eight, 1982. Nashville Next says everything, Briley and Ashland City should be preserved. So the idea of expanding IR and, and that just completely doesn't make sense. There should be a plan amendment. It raises the question, why wasn't there a plan amendment? There's not a plan amendment because it requires council participation. It requires community meetings. And they knew that that wasn't gonna be possible because that's just not the case in District 1. District 1 is a complete mess. So I request that you indefinitely defer. It's an interesting project. We've got to figure something out. They own the land by right, the church and the, and the liquor company, strange bedfellows, right? There is a solution to be had, but that requires more conversation. There's extreme concern about flooding. There's concern about industrial expansion. These questions and, and situations are not gonna be resolved in next meeting without a council person. I just implore you, if there's any sense of, of like the democratic process at this point, Let's have an, a, an election. Let's have an elected person lead us through this process as a community, because right now the community is just broken. Thank you. Thank you. Others speaking in opposition? I'll have two minutes and uh, name and address. My Thanks. name is Alfred Quinn. I live on 4485 Cato Road. Uh, if there's project goes ahead, I'll be looking at a warehouse with only one property in between myself and the warehouse. So that wouldn't be a pretty sight. When I first bought this property, I was looking at agricultural zoning and uh, private zoning, uh, residential zoning. Well, that seems to be changing all of a sudden. Uh, like the gentleman said before me, these meetings that were just thrown at us out of thin air. I mean, a little bit more notice would have been very nice. The other thing I want to follow up on is with the 18-wheeler uh, trucks that might be going through Cater Road. You know, we have a, a school there. And five days a week, twice a day, mothers drop and pick up their children. Even now, myself, I have to make an illegal left drive on, the, on Cater Road to clear all the mothers lined up because the school doesn't hold all the cars to pick up these kids. So they were all waiting out in the road. So if, you, if I want to go out and I want to pass them, I have to make a left drive to pass all the, all the cars. You know, and when you get 18 wheelers coming through there, they're going to put a cluster stop on all this because it's, it's going to be full stop. They're not going to be able to make it through there. So these mothers are going to be held up for 40, five minutes you're gonna have a lot of angry mothers and i'm sure you all have experienced angry angry mothers right so uh i i definitely wish you defer this problem 
Thank you. Thank you. Others speaking in opposition? No. Nope. Uh, if not, would the applicant like to use your two minutes for a rebuttal? Sure, thank you. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, I, I appreciate what the gentleman was just expressing about the traffic on Cater Road, and we agree. That's part of the proposals while we're doing this. Uh, first of all, the fleet is majority 14 to 16 foot box trucks, not 18 wheelers. And so, you know, if we had to, we could build there, but we would need to get out to Cato because of the access to Ashland City Highway. But those trucks can make that turn. That's not a problem. But we want to keep them off of Cato Road. I totally agree with what was just mentioned about, about the school traffic. Number two, um, the reason we want to rezone all these properties to IR, religious institution is an approved use in IR, so we wouldn't have to kind of do anything special to allow the church to operate on the north half of the property. We don't want split zoning, so it would allow us basically just to move property lines so the church could have the north and my client can take the south. That way trucks would never go to Cato Road, but we can move the truck access to, on the Ashland City Highway to the west to allow those free turning movements. I'll also, also remind you, that directly across the street to where our the truck entrance would be for the industrial is the dump. Um, so this is a very industrial corner already. And so that's those are the goals of the proposal. Again, um, you know, we we've you've heard from different members of the community. We're happy that we've already got a meeting scheduled for June 8th. We'll continue that community engagement. We would like to have a vote tonight, one way or another, so we can move on to uh, to council. So we, we uh, uh, request that you would consider that. And thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Okay, go ahead and close the public hearing. And Commissioner Clifton, I think it's your turn to share your thoughts, your opening thoughts. Well, um, this is a very interesting set of comments uh, from both proponents and opponents, and some very well-made points. And um, I, you know, I think we have a fairly limited role as a commission. We're not. Uh, I mean, we're we're supposed to be making recommendations to the elected body. Uh, based on planning principles and process and things like that as and plans we've already adopted. <clears throat> Having said that, um, I don't think we can approve it because of what our plans show. Uh, but I don't think that I agree that we need to simply defer it and take away from this council a right to vote on it. Uh, I would I would be probably supporting a motion to disapprove, but going ahead and taking a position because I think the people deserve that and have um, um, both sides deserve for us to make that decision and let the political body decide what they're going to do, as opposed to just deferring it, knowing that it would be pushed forward for a number of months. That, that's my thought about it. I, I do think some great comments were made about this company uh, and I'm very happy to have heard all that and uh, some sincere comments made by people on both sides. but. Our role is fairly clear cut. We, we need to make our best planning decision, uh, which I think would be to disapprove based on what we currently know, but with the knowledge that the council can in fact override that with the right number of votes. Thank you. Others wanting to share thoughts? I have a question to the staff. Uh, during the process, I think this plan really asking for SP. Is there any discussion for going to SP? Uh, no, I, we actually haven't seen this plan, I think, until today. So, no, there wasn't any discussion in regards to an SP. Thank you. So, I mean, if this is the intent, I think it can be good for this, you know, site. And it can be good with all the, you know, moving parts are settled and all the site plan is... Uh, assessed and so forth, but the request is, you know, entire zone to IR. Of course, you know, I have to agree with the staff and Commissioner uh, Clifton, as so it would be disapproval. But, you know, right thing for the community to do, to me personally, with defer and ask applicant to bring the SP to accommodate, you know, community's needs and entertain if community will uh, accept that. So I would be more interested in defer two meetings to have those specific plan instead of, you know, uh, 
disapproving it. I mean, if we disapprove, of course our bodies is recommended body. So council member can move to the floor and you know overwrite our recommendation and then maybe be able to overcome 27 votes. But my concern is because it will expand you know industrial area not only current one parcel but expand to three parcel so if this you know entity i i applaud the great co company so great uh, employee loyalty and that's a great but if this client does not move into it it would just expand industrial area so uh, you know that's a country district council members purview and authority but so for that reason I'm not really uncomfortable disapproving it so if you know applicant are to entertain two meeting deferral and then bring us great specific plan I'm inclined to consider I'm, I think it's actually might work so Commissioner may I offer just a, a thought on that um, if if industrial uses were retained with an SP and I agree an SP would have been a wiser choice given the environment um, would we still need a plan amendment for that I think and so what does that do to the timing I mean you would you would need for the Commission to entertain it I think you would still have to have a plan change away from a residential only policy sure so they would need to go through a process of a determination with the policy team but considering that it would be going from a rural to likely a district industrial I think at a minimum um, I would make the assumption that that would be a major amendment those are typically um, eight weeks from the time that they are submitted because they also have a required planning community meeting um, the next <clears throat> and then we have not received an application for a plan amendment the next filing deadline I think would push it well past um, the ability to stay within this term but hold on let me just let me just check that here councilman withers you do you have something while we look up timelines so it looks like the next filing deadline would be um, June 14th and on an eight-week cycle that would likely we start to skip some meetings that would probably put it into late August for commission meeting Council June 14th uh, June 14th tracks for July 27th but that's a six-week cycle so it'd have to go to the next one Councilman Withers um, I agree with uh, Commissioner Johnson that this is a pretty well thought out plan if that was what one we're going to do like that would be a good way of doing it but um, I would um, uh, I would hesitate to predict entirely, but I would say that the odds of passage of this legislation, even if it were approved by this body, uh, would be low. I mean, I will just go ahead and say that uh, this term. And so that's uh, not a reflection on the applicant team. That's certainly not a reflection on the uh, folks from the company. Really glad to hear from those folks. But as we have, uh, as I have stated before, and as true, you know, land use follows the land, not the people. And so. Um, and expanding industrial uses it, it could be a great plan but it um, there's not necessarily a guarantee that you're getting this great company and these great employees that are going to be there for forever right so I, I would sort of say that the odds of past passage of this legislation either way is very very low at least this term um, it could be something that could be taken up once a new council member is elected for district one certainly um, but given that I would respectfully to kind of speak in opposition to a deferral this time because I think that that would create uh, a lot of work for everyone including the staff um, that for something that is unlikely to pass um, probably this calendar year so um, just wanted to throw that out there but uh, again I, I do agree that the plan itself is well thought out it's just that it is very very much at odds with what we have heard from the community plan uh, community engagement in that area for a long time and so the, the odds of getting that through a plan amendment with community support uh, I, I think are low 
Anyone else? Commissioner Henley, Commissioner Tibbs, anything? Any thoughts to share? Okay, so we have some differences of opinions, uh, <laughs> but we do need a motion or, or continued discussion. I would like to move disapproval. That's a proper motion. Excuse me, approval of staff recommendation to disapprove. Okay, to disapprove, that's a proper motion. Is there a second? So we have two, okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Okay, motion carries. The item is disapproved. Um, all right, I think we are to our our last item, item 39. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to see you. You remember, see? There you go. That's good. Thank you, sir. Okay. Item 39. Okay, Eric McTravers presenting 39 on the agenda. This is a request for concept plan approval to create six lots on four acres of property on Old Charlotte Pike. The staff recommendation is to approve with conditions including a variance to the standard of 3 8 8.1, excuse me. Uh, property is zoned R15 is currently vacant. Properties to the north are zoned uh, R40 and R80. Properties to the south are R15 and, uh, excuse me, south and east are R15. And then properties to the west are uh, R80. That should not be on the slide. My apologies for that one. Uh, here's a look at the site plan. Uh, if you'll note on the left side of the, uh, the left side of the map is north. So the development consists of six single family lots on a public street, um, protected natural areas uh, in the shaded gray area on the right uh, at the south end of the site. And then uh, the areas reserved for stormwater management is near the front of the site to the left uh, screen from old Charlotte Pike. So in early 21, excuse me, early 2021, uh, Planning Commission asked staff to review the cluster lot regulations, which have been part of the zoning code since the late 90s. And the zoning, uh, the conservation development standards were the end result of that review, which replaced the cluster lot option. So these standards are intended to address the shortcomings that were identified in the cluster lots, um, including lack of preservation of natural areas. So the primary intent uh, of these new standards is the preservation of unique or sensitive areas uh, through thoughtful site planning and design flexibility. So this case is actually the first to go before planning commission under those new standards. Um, for the standards to be applicable, the minimum site area must be no less than 10 times the minimum lot area for the uh, base zoning district and also have a minimum of 10% of the site that contains natural areas. Uh, and in this case, uh, that includes slopes over 20% uh, or protected or heritage trees. The standards apply to this site. The maximum lot yield under the standards is nine lots and using the conservation design flexibility language, the minimum lot size has been reduced to an equal percentage as a percent of land set aside for undisturbed natural area from 15,000 square feet to 12,000 square feet. Um, additional open space is also provided for stormwater management and then uh, natural open space is identified and protected at the rear southern portion of the site uh, and accessible by a four foot walking trail. Uh, from the street. The applicant was required to submit a site distance study, which was reviewed and approved by NDOT. Um, staff finds the proposed subdivision is uh, consistent with the intent of uh, chapter three subdivision regulations uh, and the standards of the Metro zoning code. And lastly, there is a variance that was requested uh, to the standard three 8.1 to provide sidewalks along the northern edge, uh, or excuse me, the eastern length of the proposed public street um, the staff finds the variance is appropriate given the configuration of the dead end road. Um, the sidewalk is provided along the frontage on each lot on the west side, which allows for needed pedestrian uh, 
uh, connectivity for those lots to the public right of way. So for these reasons, uh, staff is supportive of the request and recommends uh, approval with conditions, including a variance to the standard of 3-8.1. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and open the public hearing and the applicant will have 10 minutes, as you know well. <laughs> seems, I <clears throat> seems like I recall that. Doug Sloan, 404 Barry Wood Drive. Um, first of all, I want to thank Eric. He just managed to steal most of my thunder in his presentation. Uh, he's been very thorough uh, and great to work with as we've gone through this process. Yes, uh, we also have a handout that we want to, uh, to give to the commission. Um, we know that, first of all, this, this project was brought to this the commission uh, back in 2021. Uh, and at the time, it was brought to you as an eight-lot subdivision. Uh, and it was disapproved. Um, and since that time, uh, Dr. Bethy, who's uh, the, the property owner, uh, has worked with um, uh, Michael Dewey and Dewey Engineering, uh, the planning department, uh, the NDOT, <clears throat> and the council lady who's, who's still here tonight. Thank you for, for coming, uh, Council Lady Hauser. Uh, to try and put together a better subdivision, uh, one that uh, that reduces the the number of lots, uh, and as uh, Eric pointed out earlier, the total yield for the property is actually nine under the R15 zoning, uh, and. But this is only proposing six lots with 20% of the overall four acres going towards open space. And in particular, the critical area of the lot uh, that's on the south side that includes steep slopes of over 25% and dense, uh, uh, dense tree canopy there uh, that includes a lot of heritage trees as well. And all of that is being preserved through, as he also pointed out, uh, the conservation policies that you now have in the subdivision regs. And this being the first one. Uh, I, I'll be frank with you, I think they're going, it's going to be tough to see a lot of these uh, because they are pretty stringent about the amount that you have to set aside and some of the regulations that you have to meet. Um, but we found an arrangement uh, that works well for that. Um, one of the biggest concerns that, that this commission heard in, in 2021, and that I'm sure you're going to hear again, is about traffic, uh, which is why we've given you that handout. Uh, I realize that uh, everywhere we live in Nashville, we're concerned about the traffic, we're concerned about, concerned about uh, public safety on the roads. Uh, but as you can see, the, the reality doesn't bear that out. Uh, there hasn't been any major accidents on this road since 2021. That's the research timeline that we were able to get. Uh, it's, there was, there was one, uh, one accident that was involved uh, that was attributed to a, uh, distracted driver. Uh, at least these are the, the T dot uh, information that we have available to us. Uh, there was concern uh, about uh, visibility, but as uh, Eric pointed out, uh, that we did a study. Uh, we supplied that to, N to NDOT, and they also agreed that visibility here is not uh, an issue. However, uh, we have agreed to participate in uh, supply signage uh, for Old Charlotte Pike here uh, to give warnings that there are uh, driveway entrances or any other type of uh, signage that NDOT thinks is appropriate for this location. Um, we've worked closely with our neighbors as well uh, to create a buffer along the uh, property line. We are requesting the sidewalk variance for just one side as a cul-de-sac. Uh, and I think that, that staff supports this. As a cul-de-sac, there will still be a sidewalk that leads out to Old Charlotte Pike. Uh, it just didn't seem on a cul-de-sac like this that it was necessary to have on both sides. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Michael uh, to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that we did with NDOT uh, at the entrance and with our neighbors. And I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal, please. I'm uh, Michael Dewey with Dewey Engineering 2925 Berry Hill Drive in Nashville. Uh, as Doug mentioned, this project was brought in um, 20 or a couple years ago, and I think one of the, the main concern that we've heard is, as the new engineer on this project that there was uh, traffic concerns. So we've been working fairly diligently with, uh, with NDOT on trying to address those concerns, and uh, Eric's been very helpful with uh, facilitating those uh, um, timely responses. 
from NDOT. Um, the they've ha they've asked us to do a site distance study. Um, the site, the entrance, uh, has been designed to to uh, ensure that we have adequate site distance in in both directions. Uh, they've also asked us to um, work on the vertical geometry of the of the of the proposed road, and they've also asked us to coordinate with the adjacent property owner, uh, which we've which we have also um, done. Um, so, with all of those items, they've uh, what you see tonight is is a. Uh, proposed road that has been um, essentially the construction plans have, have virtually been performed for those at the concept plan stage. So we're, we feel confident that the um, site distance is available and that the vertical geometry of this road meets T dot, uh, NDOT standards. Um, I'm happy to answer any uh, questions when, when uh, at the time, if, if needed. Thank you very much. Um, are you done? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, is there anyone here speaking in support of this project? Anyone speaking in opposition? Okay, if you will all come forward and line up and you've been here all night, but as you know, we um, you have two minutes and please start with your name and address. You have a set of slides. You have a set of slides. Okay. Yeah, bear with us and, and I'll get them up. Okay. Okay, um, so let me get up here. I'm Rachel Davis. I live at 7447 Old Charlotte Pike. I'm one of the neighbors to this property. Um, next slide. So, there are several concerns that I have with this property. Um, tonight I've seen a lot of builders that have involved their community and they have talked to them and they have adopted to what the community has asked and their requests. And I'm very disappointed in this builder because I have never been to a community meeting about this plan. Um, this version has not been brought to us. We did have a meeting back um, July 14th of 2021 about the old plan. So a lot of these things that I've learned tonight, I have just learned. So. That's not something I feel like is involving your community and your neighbors, especially your next door neighbor. So um, Bethy did reach out to me on May 16th and said he could meet with, meet with me, excuse me, at 11 or 12 that day. And I don't have time to leave my job to go meet you that day. So that's not a community meeting. When I asked if we could have a community meeting, he declined to do such a thing. So I do ask that we could do that and we could have a conversation about our concerns. So one of the things is the results from the traffic study. I don't know what those are. I see that there has been one now. And so I'd like to know what that was um, to fulfill that question. So where are we going with all of this? You know, I would like to see some road improvements because that seems to be how developments happen these days. If you are going to have a developer come in, they're going to improve your road. I don't see any road improvements in this. The, the development is going to have sidewalks, but the regular road isn't. There isn't going to be a side to that road where vehicles can pull off. So can we get a turning lane? Can we get a flashing light? Can we get a pull off? All these things are stuff that we could discuss in a community meeting that we haven't had. So what are we going to do to enhance the telephone poles? That's another thing that I've, I've seen hit. Um, I'm going to step back and I'm going to let Lauren continue with your next slide. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lauren Miles. I live at 5106 Illinois Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee. And I just wanted to bring a couple of pictures and just read a couple of facts. Um, so photo one was August 3rd, 2021. It's at 7447 Old Charlotte Pike. Someone was coming up the hill past the pros proposed subdivision and took out two telephone poles. Um, this is almost directly in front of the where the subdivision would be uh, installed. Um, and uh, yes, on then photo two is November 19th, 2021. The proposed subdivision is on the left and is directly across from the property. Power was lost for multiple re residents overnight and until the following, following day, we were unable to turn around in this area. 
Um, there was no shoulder. Um, it is a blind curb when you come up. You have to stop because you cannot see the rest of the road. Um, and the speeding cops were unable to pull over other offenders um, in this area because you, you can't see. Um, and traffic passed, uh, passing a stop vehicle must go into the turning lane at this location. Uh, would you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so these are just some recent minor events that have impacted um, the Davises. Um, so April 28th, 2023 of this year, a tree fell blocking the entire road, redirected traffic through the church parking lot, so effectively blocking the road. Um, and then just this month, uh, there was a stalled car um, where uh, Mr. Davis had to come help the lady get it out of the road. Um, luckily, there was an accident, but on that same day, another man hit a telephone pole with his tree. He lost control. Um, and I think that was at, that was later in the same day. Um, anyway, I just want to bring you these facts because this is a high accident area. And if y'all have ever been a part of cleaning up a traffic accident or an injured individual, you never want to do it again. So thank you. Hello, my name is Matthew Davis. I live at 7447 Old Charlotte Pike. I'm not really sure. Uh, I'll just get to it. Um, so there are many nights that uh, I'm up kind of late because I hear traffic go by. And sometimes 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I'll actually hear a car go off the road. You can hear it. Um, and I'm usually the first one up. Rachel is asleep. Um, Many nights or some mornings I'll come out and I'll be driving to work and I'll look over and, and the, the proposed area that's being going to be, be developed and you'll see tire tracks where somebody's run off the road. No accident, no, no report, nobody hurt, thank God. But it would be where the retaining, where the uh, runoff stormwater would be stored at if there was a spot. I'm guessing that's a ditch. So that would be a potential hazard for, for uh an unfortunately drunk person driving down the road. Um, as you can see in the pictures, there is no shoulder. There's no sidewalk. Um, and this is just a, a high, you know, it's, it's the beginning of a road um, that's, that's well-traveled any Saturday morning. You can hear on a, on a nice sunny Saturday morning, Sunday after, Saturday afternoon, you can hear motorcycles going up and down this road in, uh, in a, you know, several of them at a time, um, and uh, some of them are, are sports bikes, and you just don't, you know, they want to go fast on the back road. So I see this as a hazard as well as, you know, an unsuspecting motorist. Um, so that's pretty much all I got. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Christina Wright. I live at 3041 Morgan Road. I'm Rachel's mother. I'm a concerned parent. I would like to enter this into the record. Um, we found through our research that it is hard to get a traffic accident report. Because it was a family member, we were able to get this report. And uh, Colin Beam was an officer on uh, duty that night. His name appears on this report here. And uh, somebody, either he or his partner, said that they would come and testify before all of you all. But I tried to track him down. He was unavailable, um, one of which we were unsure of when we were going to meet with you all. Um, that was not a fatal crash, but it did happen in their front yard. This one, four crashes have occurred in the past two years. A teenage passenger was killed in a single car accident on Old Charlotte. This is a country road. And it's windy and it's turny, and where this proposed development is, it's right over a blind hill. So we are concerned about the safety that is going to happen on this road. There's already been multiple wrecks, even though the opposition said there hasn't. There's been at least four in the last two years. And the project you just approved on Sawyer Brown Road is going to send all the traffic of that project right into this road. So I am concerned about the safety. Uh, uh, for my children. Thank you for your time. Thank you. If I can enter this in the record. Sure. Give us one sec. We'll get the clock reset for you. Okay, you're good. There you go. Yeah, hi. Um, Edward Nelson, 7560, Old Charlotte Pike. Yeah, um, 
I didn't actually know what I was going to say tonight, but there were things we've all written together as a community. There are a hell of a lot of us online. You notice no one spoke in favor of this tonight. Last time you did it, there were about 30 of us, so we're down to the last guys who could make it. Um, the thing I wanted to say, you know, the, the truth about this is a country road, yeah, it has a rise. It's got a, it's a blind rise. If you come over the rise on a corner, by the way, it's not a straight, it goes over a corner. There are often people, there are a lot of trucks that go down there. The guys do um, landscaping, various things. The trouble is that because it is a country road, this is not like putting a T-junction onto a road in a city. People who hit this road, they leave their manners, on the same manners, but they the law stops at the 40, they turn off, they're no cops. As, um, I know that Commissioner Johnson came out once you rode along it and you said you literally had to ride a mile before you could even turn back. It's a very narrow, two-lane country road. You can just get past other traffic. The trouble with this is that people who come on this road, it's like you head out into the country, you think, ah, oh, the only guy out here. So you put a bit more speed, you dump out your trash, you put a few bullets through the local mailboxes and stuff. It's, it's just general fun because there is no law there. There's nowhere for a cop car to sit. So a T-junction on that road is a death trap. It's a surprise. It's not what you're expecting. If you come over 40, 40 motorcycles who go out for Sunday drives, you come over a blind rise, if someone has to stop... Maybe the first 30 stop, the rest are coming, and so is the next truck, and so is everyone. I'm going to guarantee you, within the first two years, you're going to have a death there. And it may not be one. People cannot see over that rise. You can put up things. We have speed bumps that make vibrations and things. Guys just want to go faster and faster. That is a big problem. And that's not about signage or speed limits or anything. That is... Thank put you. It, I tell you what, put it up and see. Okay. Well, thank you. That was the two minutes. I want more. Uh, <laughs> How you guys doing this evening? I'm Carson Smart, uh, 7469 North Charlotte Pike. And I'll wait until you guys, everybody receives hand up. Okay, uh, so long story short, if you guys look through this handout, you guys can see multiple accidents that have happened uh, since this development was originally proposed uh, in 2021. Uh, this is not a case of the neighbors not wanting change. This is a legitimate safety concern. Um, if you guys are familiar at all with Old Charlotte Pike, uh, you know that there's a lot of development going on right down by the Walmart and Charlotte Pike. Uh, River Road area, and then there's also a lot of uh, development going on Macquarie Lane. Those two uh, development areas are pinching Old Charlotte Pike, and as you guys know, I'm sure that Old Charlotte Pike is a country county road. It's used to take you out to the county line. Double lane, no shoulder. Uh, we don't need any mass developments, don't need any multiple houses, let alone an entire street being uh, added and adjacent to this street. Um, again, I, I urge you to please look through, uh, you know, the pictures you guys can see. Multiple people have already said it, that there is a blind curve. Uh, it's not only a curve, but it's a hill. Um, and last uh, meeting, it, when we were deferred, the Wednesday before that, I had, uh, have a picture of it. I was at home and there was a, a truck that went uh, literally off the road into the ditch and took out my entire neighbor's uh, basically bushes and everything across the street landscaping. Um, and he's working that all, all out right now. Um, but this is this is a legitimate concern. This is not, again, just something that, you know, we're not trying to be neighborly. Um, and that I don't even want to go into that because the guy that's proposed this has not been neighborly. He hadn't been out to the property, hadn't put out signs, hadn't knocked on doors. This this entire thing is trying to get pushed through before the next election, and I strongly urge you guys to look at it for the safety of your constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Linda Dudash. I live at 7400 Old Charlotte Pike. I did not know about this meeting until two days ago. Two years ago, I attended the community meeting 
and that was um, that proposal was disapproved. But I have heard absolutely nothing about this until a couple days ago. Um, I have the privilege of living exactly at the intersection of Old Hickory, Sawyer Brown, Charlotte, Old Charlotte Pike, and River Road. And as I pull out of my driveway, it's somewhat of a um, health hazard because I look up the hill to my right to Old Charlotte, and we have this big blind curve there. And you can really, you can see nothing. I kind of inch out of my driveway. The same thing is true for my next door neighbor who would have liked to have been here, but she's out of the country. Um, she's at 7430 Old Charlotte Pike, and her situation is even worse because she is closer to the blind curve. Um, Last summer, we had someone barreling down Old Charlotte who ended up taking out a tree in our front yard. Uh, my husband ended up driving the guy and his baby back to their home, which was up further Old Charlotte. So it is definitely a, a hazard. One of the pictures that you saw had a big white mailbox. That's my neighbor's. Um, the other thing is everything there is farm. I live on five acres. We're a registered farm. Um, there are anywhere west of me, to my knowledge, there are no developments per se. So it would affect the neighborhood as well. And that, that's a concern as well. But I'd really like to know more about the project. And also, um, over, overall creek runs through our property. Whenever it rains, we end up getting flooded, as does my neighbor. We're in floodplains, and I have no idea what the impact of this development would be on um, our flood situation. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Up, oh, we get one more behind you. Good evening. Thank you for your time. I know it's getting late. My name is James Wright. I live on 30401 Morgan Road, Jilton, Tennessee. But my daughter and son-in-law are neighboring to that lot. And um, the concern is just safety, not just for the neighbors, but for people to travel through, too. Because um, as my son-in-law said, a couple of nights he was awake. And, well, well, he was still awake, but he'd, he'd hear a crash and he'd go out and check it out. It, there is a curve. It is dangerous. But the thing of it is, uh, just tonight, you approved a project, a stone's throw from there, that's going to add traffic. In fact, it's even saying that old Charlotte would be used somewhat during the construction phases. But more than that, I have seen from my own experience using Waze or, or Google Maps that it, they love putting you through neighborhoods. If there's traffic, if things are backed up, it's going to put you through these side roads. And I know people with subdivisions, you know, we went to... Um, um, Pigeon Forge and Waze took us through all these back roads, well not back roads, all these developments and I'm sure people hate that, all these cars coming by their yards because Waze says this is the way to go and we said we're not doing this going back Waze, we did it a different way. But my point is it's a dangerous area, you've just approved more housing, more traffic, even saying you're going to be using Old Charlotte during that time. And so we just have to be sure that safety issues are taken into account. And when something is done, it's done right for the safety of the community. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Okay, now the applicant may have his two minutes for rebuttal. So I'll be quick. Um, Ms. Davis pointed out that there's not been another community meeting other than the one that happened in 2021. But I want to point out that this is not a zone change. We're not asking for a zone change. This is just a subdivision. Uh, uh, we're asking you to, to review the subdivision plat based off of the subdivision regulations. So there's not a mandated uh, community meeting. That they, they've had that, and we heard this, the concerns about the traffic, and we addressed that and <clears throat> did the, um, the site distance study uh, and worked with NDOT, NDOT to address those concerns. Um, as far as the, the flooding concern, there's a detention pond uh, that has been designed at the front of the, of the project, uh, and then over 20% or 20% of it is being preserved under the conservation uh, subdivision regs. Um, we don't know the exact how homes that are going to be built there right now. Uh, Dr. Bethy is a member uh, at the Hindu temple that's nearby, uh, and he plans on building his dream home at the end of the cul-de-sac uh, and some of his uh, the other members of the, the temple 
I uh, also plan on building homes in, in this subdivision. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael uh, Dewey to talk a little bit about the site distance study. I'll be quick. Um, so site distance was a, um, a, a major concern from NDOT that they had us look into. Um, and it's they had us look at uh, placing the entrance on the east side of the property and on the west side of the property. And um, uh, this is the best design that's uh, come before for, for this subdivision. Um, the elevation is brought up from uh, along the side of Old Charlotte Pike. And uh, we meet the site distance um, uh, requirements um, that's been uh, coordinated with uh, NDOT. Thank you very much. Um, we'll close the public here. Well, no, sorry. Council Lady Hauser, do you want to come up and speak? I just wanted to add a couple of things that have not been mentioned yet. Sorry about the feedback. I'm not good at this. Yeah, the I, I met last week with the Dr. Bending, and he has agreed to put in, as suggested by planning the NDOT, solar flashing lights, curve ahead, whatever planning at NDOT says is the most uh, effective way to help people know there is a curve ahead and to slow down. While well, planning had told me the accidents that have happened on this road have mostly been to the fact that people were going too fast. Uh, you can't stop people, you can't legislate stupid out. It just is. Uh, but he, he is willing to work with planning at NDOT to do whatever can be done to at least alert people. And I really like planning and suggestion of the solar flashing lights, and he's willing to pay for that. Okay, thank you. Well, with that, I will declare the public hearing closed. And um, Commissioner Tibbs, would you like to start us? Um, you know, basically just as a subdivision, I think it like uh, it meets policy, you know, I think the going to the single lots, you know, um, was, you know, receptive of our comments last time. Um, the biggest concern of the uh, neighbors is the, um, you know, the pot hazardous, potential hazardous condition that they brought up. And it sounds like the council woman has already started looking at ways to make this area more, you know, ob obvious. I don't know if traffic calming, other traffic calming things can be added. You know, I think that's something that she would be able to potentially work for. Um, but it didn't, it didn't seem like it was necessarily in opposition to the development as much as opposition of a concern about the danger to it. So I, I think if there could be more, um, you know, things that she can continue to work with NDOT to make the visibility uh, uh, for this potential, you know, potential hazardous areas is the main thing that needs to happen, might need to happen, even if it wasn't in development, obviously. So uh, I would, I'd be, you know, uh, go with the staff recommendation for it, but definitely with the council person's, um, uh, yeah, uh, um, involvement in how this road can be uh, safer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I remember this one, you know, when it came, uh, came to our body. And so that time, I, you know, I'm familiar with that area, but uh, I drove it uh, that time. And this time I drove the uh, area again. So I do appreciate this plan is utilizing newly approved conservation uh, subdivision. So it has the changes, uh, retention, uh, stormwater retention at front, and then back uh, lot is now completely, completely uh, undisturbed. So I do appreciate that. But 
something has not changed. That is, we cannot do anything about Charlotte Pike being local to Lane because this is the edge of the policy. This is the you know T3 neighborhood evolving policy. So this one, it says T3, you know, road designation is uh, T3 uh, RCA2 but the next one is T2 RCA2, but it's same road. It's just the designation is changes, but it's two lane street and then no shoulder, especially the right side. So still, you know, hazardous condition uh, remains. I understand, and that is uh, kind of approved of the site distance, but I still have street uh, 39, street uh, condition, because site distance means it met just minimum. So most of my concern is related to, I think, uh, subdivision regulation 3-3, uh, three suitability of the land, and 3-4, lot requirement. And of course, the safety is 3-9, requirement for streets. So here's what I'm kind of concerned. Uh, you know, I live in, on the hill, so I'm really familiar with up on the hill. So my neighbors has lots of, you know, long houses up on the hill. So they do have long, uh, steep, uh, steep driveway. So this driveway is uh, straight. And if I'm reading correctly, front entryway and back of the lot, at least 50 feet elevation different. And lot one, two, three, four, five, are uh, kind of stuck each other alongside of the driveway. So um, not only that, each lot, lot one, two, front of the lot and back of the lot, elevation is 10 feet different. So I'm sure, you know, some engineer can figure out uh, grading and so forth, but I don't feel comfortable because it's steep driveway straight and, you know, lot kind of stuck on each other and then at least 50 feet elevation different. So it, like, I literally not comfortable with the suitable of the lot. And the reason I'm saying is, you know, like my neighbors, when it's snow is forecasted. Everybody put the car on the street. I put my car on the street, but with this and with this straight, steep driveway, where do they put the car if we, you know, snow was forecasted? Or even heavy rain. So with that, I am really concerned. So in my head, I still, does not feel like this is meet the subdivision regulation, especially 3-3, uh, three three, suitability of the land, 3-4, lot requirement, and 3-9, requirement meant for street. So that's why I, uh, my assessment. Thank you. Others, Councilman Withers, Commissioner Henley, Commissioner Clifton, further comment? Commissioner Henley. So I think there's, in the staff report, I mean, there seems to be, again, conditions, but there's also just the the one variance that's there. And I think that's an acknowledgement of some of the challenges with the site. And, and, and to me, as I interpret it, it seems like that has been a specific area of concern for the staff. They've looked at it. They've proposed and even augmented what we would require to accommodate some of those things is it perfect i don't think it's going to be right there. i think we we're we're acknowledging it's not going to be perfect it's a, it's a difficult condition but i'm, I'm just curious I mean, outside of that variance i mean i think we're acknowledging the site itself um is suitable as as a staff for this type of development and we've made some adjustments for um how to handle that condition probably to the to the best of our abilities outside of people desiring desiring to just see it as not a multi multiple unit development i'm wondering i mean i'm wondering what else can we articulate or augment on this site that's there that the applicant already hasn't already said that they would be willing to to work with um in dot to do i kind of feel like we're getting to that point where it's 
if one person's leaving, it's still going to be unsafe because everyone who's giving us comments about safety, that that's what's already there today. And I know we we get to this point more often than I I like, and it just continues to bring up the fact that we just we don't do a good job on our roads that are. I mean, we had one today, then it wasn't a rural road; it was just a road that just should have been improved. And so I think when we have applicants that are willing to contribute to not only their interface with, with these roads, but also to go out into the roads and, and add some type of safety measure. And they're looking to us to prescribe what that is. I think, again, we, we're looking to NDOT to say what, what can be done with the road that is there today to improve it. So I guess it's also a good reminder, I guess, Director, can you share with us kind of like what's in our purview when we're thinking about subdivisions? Yes. So, the state uh, requires that the planning commission uh, create and implement subdivision regulations, which is simply the division of land. It is not an entitlement increase. So a zone change would increase a property owner's ability to do residential development or commercial development. A subdivision basically looks at the placement of streets, the uh, size of lots and the like. And so when we adopt the subdivision regulations, it is really important to create a predictable path for both the property owners and the community to know what is expected. This particular property is zoned R15, which is a moderately intense suburban zoning district. It is not agriculture, it's not RS40. This has been zoned for some time. And so one of the challenges, and I know we haven't talked about density, but when we're talking about development and development profile, I think zoning drives a lot of those decisions and that is not on the table for this body. So we've made a lot of progress, I think, over the last few years of looking at sites given their zoning and trying to accomplish benefits that we think are important. And we spent a year, more than a year, working on the conservation subdivisions. We removed the cluster lot option based on community feedback, and we moved to conservation, which is more oriented to protecting open spaces and the like, and gives more flexibility uh, to the sizes of the lots as a way of balancing the more rigorous standards that we're applying today. And so all that's to say, I want to reassure the commission that the conservation subdivision uh, standards themselves were carefully vetted with the community <laughs> and uh, are ones that we gave a lot of thought to. Now, having said that, I think um, that to both commissioners' questions. Lisa, uh, can you uh, or the team speak to the, the street width here um, for the internal uh, road? The new constructed road? Yes. <clears throat> sure, that meets, it does meet, the, it's a, um, it's a standard city street right of way. Um, it would be a public road. Um, it is, I believe it's a 46 foot right of way, which is pretty standard for a small local. Um, so to the commissioner's question about, um, and I'm sort of speaking to both about placement of parking in the event of a weather event or something like that, I assume that that would allow for on-street parking given that we're serving six lots. Yeah, I mean, typically something of that width, you're gonna have a standard pavement width. I mean, it's either 11 or 12 foot lanes. Um, and so you would have the ability to likely park on one side of the street and still maintain um, traffic. Um, the, the talking about sort of the slope of the lot, the most intense portions of the lot following the conservation subdivision standards um, are set aside as open space. So the 25% lot, there's 25% slope is on the on the back sides of the lot. And so the, the front lots, while critical, have much less um, slope on them than on the back side of the lot. So Commissioner Henley, I don't know if that answers your question other than to say that that we've required a standard that for 
the number of lots that are uh, included here. Um, and then I don't know if you have any follow up there, but hopefully that was helpful context. I know that helped. I mean, the, the, the reason for the comment that I made in the question is, you know, they're aligning with policy and the, and the only thing that I saw in the report that is outside of policy is a variance that we took on to say that it makes it even safer. Um, and, and I think to me, that's acknowledging that there's been efforts to continue to improve the plan, recognizing all the concerns that have been brought before this body. Thank you. Further comments? If no, uh, yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I can imagine how I would feel in their position. Um, it would be like me to say that I'd like to live there, but I'd like to be the last person to live there. That's how I would feel about it. But I'm not suggesting that's a as a nasty thing. I just they see and hear what happens. The 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 the, the neighbors to to this uh, proposed subdivision, but it to take away the right to build this when it seems to comply and it doesn't even maximize what they could do. It is beyond what I'm willing to, to be for. Um, so I'll be supporting this, uh, a motion to approve when it's made. Are you making a motion to approve? I will. Okay. I will. will we approve the staff recommendation. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right, with that, I think we are onto the fun item of uh, officer nominations. Is that correct? Yes. So, yes. Yes, let's be mean to the chair. Yeah, I was gonna say, since he's not here, um, is there anyone, and I would like to nominate our esteemed Chair Adkins to continue in his role for another year. <laughs> Any discussion? Anyone want to challenge him? Does, does he get a stipend for that? No. Some <laughs> agile. All right. Uh, do I have a motion to approve Commissioner uh, Chairperson Adkins? Any other second? Okay, any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Uh, next, we have the nomination for vice chair. Yes, <laughs> I would like to nominate Madam Chair and current vice chair for to continue vice chair position. Any other discussion? Oh, wait, we need a motion. <laughs> Oh, she, oh, that's right. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I am tired. <laughs> All in favor. Okay. Motion carries. Um, our third uh, position is the Historic Zoning Commission. I would like to nominate uh, Commissioner Johnson to continue serving us on both commissions. So including planning and the Historic Zoning Commission. That is a proper. I'll second. Any, any further discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. So now uh, we have another one. We have the new Parks Board representative because I guess Commissioner Haynes really isn't coming back. <laughs> With a lot of thought, I've decided I would like to nominate Ed Henley to be the Board of Parks and Rec. <laughs> any other discussion? You have big shoes to fill. <laughs> All in favor? Okay, motion carries. And last but not least, do we need another executive committee representative? Oh, we do. Okay. Well, I'd love to nominate Commissioner Tibbs for this honor. I think it's only appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion? All right. All in favor? As long as we have six commissioners here, everybody's going to get a special role. <laughs> okay, we have done 41. So with our esteemed historic 
Commission representative. Do you have any updates? Yes, I do have actually uh, a very exciting uh, report. So on May 17th meeting, uh, Metro Historic Zoning Commission presented the first annual preservation leadership recognition to Haynes Heights neighborhood leaders, along with uh, Council Member Toombs. Because Haynes Heights neighborhood is really interesting neighborhood, so I would like to briefly introduce why they're selected. So the first mention of Haynes Heights as subdivision happened October of 1954. So Davidson County Planning Commission, I'm sure no one was uh, you know, serving at that time, approved 14.2 acres development for African American, which would include 102 homes. So many of the homes are representative of the popular mid-century ranch style including traditional, transitional, and split-level forms with a wide variety of architectural features and materials. So despite of the goals of residents to create a modern and safe neighborhood for their families, racism made its way into the neighborhood. In October 1957, series of cross-burning occurred across the Davidson County. However, African-American Nashville still praised Haynes Heights as a symbol of black prosperity and neighborhood continued to grow throughout the 1960s. But, and then in 1964, Haynes Heights resident organized the Haynes Heights Community Civic League. Since then, they fought commercial community center in 1969, landfill along the Trinity Lane in 1973, apartment complex entrance in their neighborhood in 1988, rezoning to produce warehouse in 1992 and 1995, and group home in 2001 and apartment complex in 2017. In addition, the Haynes Heights resident fought against displacement due to highway development, which was ultimately rerouted. So with this, Haynes Heights Neighborhood Association Inc., uh, the community neighborhood was still intact. So in uh, 2018, they are the one initiated Haynes Height neighborhood conservation uh, overlay. So it was approved despite of uh, COVID. So therefore, we were so proud to give first leadership award. That's very exciting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Parks and Recreation, did you get ahead of the game and go to a meeting before you were nominated? <laughs> it's not quite able to fulfill, so I, I'll improve in my stead. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for taking on the role. Um, executive Committee, I don't I don't think we have one other than, obviously, we have a lean group of people. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll have some more commissioners joining us soon. Um, it's going out, you know, <laughs> taking names and inviting people. So we, we really, we just have one real absence of current members? Two. Okay. Right? Greg and, who? Greg and Commissioner Lawson. Lawson. Yeah. And I've been here in a couple of months. Oh. Okay. So yeah, that, that's a problem. Yeah. yeah. We're working on it. What I would ask is that when we um, poll you for the next couple of meetings, if you can just let us know, it'd be helpful for me to be able to check quorum. We're just in a really tough moment because of where we are in the council term. And so many people, it's like the six pound thing, trying to get into the one pound hole. Um, and so we're, you know, what you can do is, communicate with us and we're working on the appointments. There were two that were put, put forward at council and unfortunately were deferred uh, to meetings. And so we'll be working with that um, body to, where are you? They were deferred to? Yes. 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 Okay. Our fearless, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> liaison and, and over in chair, we'll, we'll, have, we'll work with us. So. Try not to 
We're just the fun slayers here, you know. <laughs> We are uh, having lots of fun uh, in budget season. So um, rumor has gone around that Nashville's uh, sales taxes have been really good, uh, sales tax collections. And so everyone's like, hey, I hear that our budget's going to be good. And so we have all these requests. So um, there are always more requests than we have funds, no matter how many funds we have. So, um, but we uh, will be very busy. We have a, next week somewhat off, but then we have uh, Metro Council on Tuesday, June the 6th, and then Planning Commission on June the 8th. So that will be a long week. So hope everyone is able to rest up over this weekend. All right. Well, with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Don't move. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Thank you all.